Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. This is a beautiful day to have this uh, wonderful event. And I'm glad to see so many people turn out. Um, we are so pleased to kick off our National Capital Esteemed Speaker Series for 2019 with Dr. Richard Horwitz. Uh, as you know, he is a very, very well-known doctor, and he has taken the time to come down here today and be with us and share his latest research and his latest treatment protocol. I know you all are excited to hear this, so I won't take up too much time, but I do need to make a few announcements. First of all, for those that don't know me, my name is Monty Skall, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Capital Lyme Disease Association. We've been here at Sibley Hospital for over 18 years, offering support and education to newly diagnosed and chronic Lyme disease patients. And I would like to thank Sibley's Senior Citizens Association for working and partnering with us for all those years. Um, they're under the directorship of Marty Bailey and her staff. So I don't think Marty's here, but maybe some of her people are. And so I want to thank you all for making this room available for us for this very important uh, presentation today. Uh, second, you all can see that over the years, Sibley, especially in the last five years, has really grown and expanded. And part of that expansion has been offering new treatment modalities. Uh, and one of them I was very interested in that they just opened is their Department of Integrative Medicine. And I asked um, Harpreet who is in charge of the office there, and she's a nurse practitioner, to come today, because I know our community really values uh, different modalities of treatment. And so she's going to tell you very quickly a little bit about what they offer here. Thank you. Thank you, Monty. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Well, welcome all to Sibley. Um, I'm very excited that you're all here. Um, love to be part of this um, amazing um, event and um, a chance to meet Dr. Horowitz. So at Sibley Integrative Medicine that opened April 30th of last year, we're almost uh, one year old this month, uh, we offer acupuncture um, therapy, we have massage therapy, yoga therapy, we do integrative medicine consults, which are done by both myself and Dr. Rosie Scheinberg. Uh, we both are trained in integrative medicine, so my doctorate is in integrative health and healing from University of Minnesota. And we're very passionate, and so we're trying to live those lives and you know, incorporating all these hacks that we can do to enhance our well-being. So I welcome you um, here at Sibley. In fact, I was going to ask, Monty, if there is an interest, end of the day uh, at 4 o'clock, if you'd like to have a quick tour, I will stay back and make sure that if I can have a raise of hand of Maybe, maybe yes, if you would be interested in some, um, okay. So I'll stay back and be available after four to make sure that I can bring you for five, 10 minute tour of the place, even when, if everybody else is busy from the staff members, so I can escort you up to our place. Thank you so much. And I'll be outside and we'll um, entertain questions after four o'clock. Thank you so much. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you, Harpreet. Um, I will tell you, the Department of Integrative Medicine is just right down the corridor, so it's not that far a walk. Um, oh, yes, please, everybody, would you turn your cell phones off? <laughs> uh, now, we're very pleased also to have a very good friend of ours who has spoken here at least two or three times over the years over those 18 years, Dr. Sam Shore. And Dr. Shore is from the Northern Virginia Internal Medicine Group. And he's also uh, runs the Loudoun Lyme uh, Commission down in Loudoun. And he's here to tell you about a special event that's going to take place. Is it at the end of this month? At the end of May. Dr. Shore. Monty, I'll make this very brief. Um, May 30th at the Belmont Country Club in Loudoun County at 7 p.m. We're having an update on the Federal Tick-Borne Disease Working Group 
that is going to present both the chair, John Alcott, and the co-chair, Kristen Honey, as uh, speakers for that event, so that if anybody is interested, that's Thursday, May 30th at 7 p.m., Belmont Country Club, Loudoun County. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shore. Um, our last announcement, our marketing director, Veronica Holenstein, would you come forward? If you notice, can all the board stand up today, please, real quick? Uh, in the back there, girls, stand up. I see those lime green t-shirts. Can you stand up? Yeah. This, this, this is just a few of our board members, but we came here decked out today for a reason. And I'm going to let Veronica tell you about it. All right. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our esteemed speaker series. We are so happy to see such a big crowd here today. Um, so you probably already know this, but NatCap Lime is 100% a volunteer-run nonprofit. So we rely on the generosity of this community here to support our mission. You may have read about a new study from uh, Dr. Ying Zhang out of John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins on persistent bacteria. Well, we helped to fund this research. We also funded physician training at the ILADS conference this past November, and we worked closely with Old Dominion University and awarded them a grant uh, to look for Babesia in the Virginia tick populations. This allows for informed policies to be generated and provides information to the citizens of Virginia about the actual risk of pathogens in our area. So what I'm trying to say is that we're working on a lot of projects that directly impact this community. So if you're interested in helping to support our mission, then what we're asking you to do today is sign up for our Finish Lime Run. Um, it's pretty easy to do. You can scan. Uh, this barcode with your phone or go to finishlime.org. We'll also be available after this presentation to help you register. And um, it really helps to support our mission. Um, we're able to do what we do because of your support. So thank you so much for everyone's uh, continued support over the years. We do sincerely appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Okay, we're almost there. I would like to ask our legislative counsel, Susan R. Green, to come up and introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Monty. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you and welcome, for, welcome to you for coming. Um, in our distinguished speaker series, Nat Cap Lime has had the privilege of introducing and, and presenting to you a number of speakers, all of whom are really remarkable. But today we have a really special guest. Dr. Richard Horowitz is a board certified internist, and he's from Hyde's Park, New York. He's the medical director of the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center. That's an integrative medical center combining classical and complementary approaches in treatment of Lyme and tick-borne disorders. He's treated in tw over 12,000 patients in the last 29 years, many of them hailing from across the country, Canada, and Europe, all coming to Poughkeepsie, New York, in order to see him. He's a former assistant director of Medicine Vassar Brothers Hospital in Poughkeepsie. He's a founding member and past president of the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society, as well as a past president of the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Educational Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization whose goals are to help educate care providers regarding vector-borne diseases. He was awarded the Humanitarian of the Year Award from <coughs> Turn the Corner Foundation. He's authored two books, New York Times bestsellers, I might add. And the first book is Why Can't I Get Better? Solving the Mystery of Lyme and Chronic Disease. <clears throat> and that was published in 2013. It explains his full classical and integrative approach to the treatment of Lyme disease and co-infections. How Can I Get Better? 
an action plan for treating resistant chronic disease was published in 2016 and is available for purchase in the lobby following his presentation. He serves on the <coughs> Tick-Borne Disease Working Group and is a pioneer in the field, major contributor to understanding and treating this insidious disease. I could stand up here all day and extol his virtues and contributions, but I think you'd probably rather hear from him than me. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you our friend, Dr. Richard Horowitz. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to be at John Hopkins. I did have the pleasure of serving at the HHS uh, Tick-Borne Disease Working Group with John Hopkins, um, eminent professor John Alcott with Kristen Honey. And for those of you who have been looking for answers, I must say that I've been very encouraged by the work that's been done in the last several years. We are definitely making progress. Uh, for those of you who have not seen the work that we've done at the HH uh, Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, you should go on the website, hhs.gov, hhs.gov, front slash Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. You will find on there not only the report to Congress that we gave several months ago, uh, which discusses the epidemiology, prevention, uh, diagnostics, therapeutics, the role of co-infections, access to care, all of this is discussed, but you'll also find um, reports from subcommittees. I was the co-chair of the other tick-borne diseases and co-infection subcommittee with Alan Richards, who works with the Department of Defense. If you go on and your doctors, for example, have questions about co-infections, about diagnostics, about therapeutics, um, we had some of the world's experts in the United States come together uh, sit on these subcommittees and you will find 150 to 200 page reports on the HHS website. You should actually share those with your physician because this is some of the most up-to-date science that exists at this point, uh, which eventually should help drive guidelines as far as how we as physicians and healthcare practitioners help those of you with Lyme disease. So there's one really big main message that I have for you today, which is you should have hope because I've been working on this for 32 years. I've seen over 13,000 people, it's over 12,000, it's now over 13,000, who come to me from across the United States, from all over Europe, and I've been searching for answers. I used to joke with people that my MD after my name stands for medical detective, because all I've been doing is trying to find answers, and I've had the personal experience with my wife having been sick. We've been married for 23 years, and the good news is, with the protocol that I'm about to discuss with you today, uh, the Dapsone Combination Therapy, which I know a lot of you have come here today to hear about, my wife is now almost going in two years in full remission for the first time in 23 years of our marriage. She has no symptoms whatsoever, as long as she's strict with staying with her mast cell diet, staying away from histamine foods, and doing all the things that you need to take care of yourself. So what I'm gonna share with you today are two scientific articles that were just published in the peer review literature. Uh, one was in the International Journal of Medicine. It was just published six weeks ago, which discusses 200 patients. It was a retrospective study on dapsone combination therapy. And the reason I came up with this therapy actually has to do with John Hopkins researchers. So I've been following, as most of you, uh, researchers like Dr. Ying Zhang, who's from Hopkins. And several years ago, Dr. Yang, Ying Zhang and others published with Dr. Feng that Borrelia burgdorferi is a persister bacteria. Now, for those of us who've been doing this for a long time, we've known that Lyme persists in the body. That was not the question. But when I heard the word that it's a persister bacteria, it made me think of the times that I was at Mount Sinai doing my internal medicine residency uh, 35 years ago with HIV patients who had mycobacterium infections. They had tuberculosis. They had MAI, Mycobacterium avium intracellulare. So I had experience using tuberculosis drugs 35 years ago, and I always wanted to use these drugs for Lyme patients because even though the drugs we were using and the natural therapies we're using were helping people, it was very clear that in a large subset of people, these organisms would just keep growing back. So when I heard that it was a persister bacteria, I went to the literature and I looked up tuberculosis and leprosy. And I had already used rifampin, as most of us had done for years, 
But I looked at two drugs that I had wanted to use for a long time. One of them was pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide is used in tuberculosis regimens to shorten the course of treatment. So if someone with tuberculosis comes in and they don't have multi-drug resistant TB, they give them INH, rifampin, and pyrazinamide. Well, I'll show you the study that we published about three years ago on a patient who had an unknown autoimmune disease called Bisset syndrome. The medical doctors really don't know the cause, although I'll show you what I think the cause is due to. It's Bartonella. And I'll show you what pyrazinamide does for these patients who have failed 20 years of rheumatologists and how it helps certain of these symptoms using mycobacterium drugs. Drugs that are used for slow-growing intracellular persistent pathogens that are difficult to kill. But the drug that really made it to my attention was called Dapsone. Now, Dapsone is a drug that's been available in the literature for many, many years. They use it for Bisset syndrome, an autoimmune disease. They use it for acne. They use it for dermatitis herpetiformis. They use it for toxo. They use it for malaria, right? So it's been used for many, many different diseases but it never had been used for Lyme disease. I looked up the qualities of this drug, and I noticed that one of the interesting things about it is it was good for autoimmune diseases. How many here in the audience have had autoimmune manifestations with rheumatoid factors, anti-nuclear antibodies, anti-thyroid antibodies, anti-gangliocide, please raise your hand. That would be the majority of the audience. So you need something to basically help to take this overstimulated immune system and balance it out. Dapsone has anti-inflammatory effects, and I'll show you exactly what it does. Dapsone also has an anti-malarial effect. How many people in the room have been diagnosed with babesiosis, this malaria-like parasite? The vast majority of you. That would be those of you who complain of day sweats, night sweats, chills, flushing, air hunger, I can't catch my breath, I have an unexplained cough. How many of you still suffer from that symptom? Great, so obviously many of you have been helped by the treatments, but some still have ongoing symptoms. Dapsone has anti-malarial properties. It can help with Babesia. But it's a persister bacteria. They use it for leprosy. And if you look in the literature for treating leprosy, they give rifampin and Dapsone for one year, and they cure leprosy. I said, well, that would be interesting. What if I took doxycycline, which treats Lyme disease, and it treats ehrlichiosis, and it treats anaplasmosis, and it treats Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and it has some effect on Bartonella and all of these other pathogens, tularemia. What if I took that and I combined it with a drug regimen that's used for another persister bacteria? And that is how I came up with the regimen. And I'll show you the culture results that we have, and there's a new study that is not yet published that will be coming out of the University of New Haven, with Dr. Eva Shapi, where we will be showing you that Dapsone combination therapy and culture turns out to be the most effective combination for hitting the biofilm forms and the persister forms of Lyme. So there are several basic points I want you to take home today. If you first of all go on the websites for the International Journal of Medicine and you look up Horowitz 2019, Dapsone, you will find the first article, part one of this precision medicine article. Uh, please feel free to take a photo when it comes up um, on the slides. The second study was published in the journal Healthcare late in 2018. It's part two of precision medicine, defining, diagnosing, and treating chronic resistant Lyme and PTLDS. These two articles are basically a summary. My publisher wanted me to write a third book on Lyme. I said, I don't need to write a third book. I just wrote two articles. They're 50 pages long. She was not happy to hear that, by the way. Um, I said, nope, I've got all the new data in there. If you take these articles to your doctor, for those of you who are still ill looking for solutions, and you do this in a very, very specific manner of piece by piece going through the 16-point MSIDS map that I'm about to show you that is now published in the peer review literature. Um, I took 657 volumes of charts of 200 patients. I'm sorry I didn't take pictures of this. Literally, the charts were above my head in my room, and I was pulling the data out of the charts from the 16 points and then had a whole group of researchers come in, put it into an Excel file, multiple then statisticians run the numbers. I'm gonna show you what we got. The point of all of this is what we found is it's not just Lyme that's keeping people sick. It is Babesia, which is persisting in the body. It is Bartonella, multiple species, which is persisting in the body. 
It is mycoplasma species. As I'll show you, we found mycoplasma fermentans, which is the primary mycoplasma species found in ticks, discovered by Garth Nicholson years ago. You can find it in the co-infection report on the hhs.gov website. We found that showing up in patients despite long-term antibiotics. We found tularemia. 16% of the patients we tested in this group, who were the sickest in my practice, tested positive for tularemia, which is transmitted by ticks. Now, it's also a bioterrorist agent. So anytime the health department sees this, we usually get a phone call to find out whether it was from a tick bite or whether we're having some right, bioterrorist problem. It's always from ticks so far. But for those of you who've been to Cape Cod, there's actually aerosolized tularemia. The sea air actually aerosolizes it, and you inhale it. So you get pulmonary forms of this particular disease. There's been outbreaks in Cape Cod. There's been outbreaks in Colorado. By the way, I'm not trying to overly scare you here. I'm just trying to educate you when I'm telling you this. And then we found brucella, another intracellular pathogen. So take home message number one. What is making the people sick? The MSIDS map is 16 points. The first point is infections. A, 1A bacteria, Lyme, relapsing fever, Ehrlichia, anaplasma, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Q fever, tularemia, brucella. Okay, so you've got to look for all these bacterial infections. 1B, parasites. Babesia is showing up in over 80% of my patients, but not just Babesia microti. Also Babesia duncani otherwise known as WA1. Now, this is the first article that's been published in the medical literature. I spoke to Sue Visser from the CDC. They did not know that Babesia duncani has moved to the East Coast. There's only been 13 documented WA1 Babesia cases by the CDC. I'll show you the literature and what we found when we started testing our patients, how far this organism has spread. Why is that important? If you're still sick and you have day sweats, night sweats, chills, flushing, air hunger, I can't catch my breath, cough, and your Babesia microti was the only strain of Babesia you checked, you have got to check for, for WA1 duncani, and not just by antibodies. You also have to do PCR, polymerase chain reaction, DNA, and FISH, fluorescent in situ hybridization. It's an RNA test. Through Igenix, it fluoresces green under the microscope. And I'll show you why, because around a third of our patients who were seronegative, negative antibodies, were positive by fish, meaning the Babesia was there and the doctors missed it, okay? Important take-home point. Why else is Babesia important? Babesia suppresses your ability to get rid of other parasites. So if you happen to have toxo, if you happen to have intestinal parasites, where you're constantly passing ropeworm and these intestinal parasites, the Babesia interferes with your immune system's ability to get rid of these other parasites. So you've got to get rid of the Babesia, okay? C, when we're looking at this, viruses. This is the first study that I'm going to show you that has been published, that herpes virus 6, which is slap cheek disease. You get it when you're a child, just about everybody has been exposed. It reactivated in some of our sickest Lyme patients. This has never been published before. So some of our sickest patients, their titers of HHV6 went up fourfold, and they were PCR DNA positive in the blood. Okay? Most of the doctors are not looking for reactivation of viral infections. And I'll show you also about Powassan virus, about tick-borne encephalitis, and why you need to be looking for that also. And then the fourth is fungus and candida. Now, for those of you who saw the New York Times yesterday about Candida auris, there's new strains of fungus. Some of you are shaking your heads. You saw the article in the New York Times. There is a resistant fungus that is now going around. Now, thank God, as far as I know, none of our patients have been exposed. But I look for all of these bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungus, and I'll show you the mold toxin showing up in people. That's just 0.1 out of 16, right? A, bacteria, B, parasites, C, viruses, D, fungus. So when you're going to your doctor saying, I'm still sick and I need you to do a very logical approach of going through these 16 points piece by piece, they're then going to look at your autoimmune markers with N-I nuclear antibodies and rheumatoid factors. They're going to look at your immune system. As I'll show you, we've suspected for years that Lyme patients had immune deficiency. This was the first study in humans to prove 
that over 20% of our patients were immune deficient, and if you don't make antibodies, you cannot get rid of these infections easily. That's why some of you have needed IVIG. Can I see a show of hands? People are on IV immunoglobulins in the audience. Just a handful, okay. In our practice, it actually turns out to be quite a bit more. And then point four is gonna be toxins. I'm gonna to talk to you about mercury and lead and environmental toxins like mold. I'm gonna to talk to you about food allergies. I'm gonna to talk to you about sleep disorders, hormone disruption. So how do you think about all of these things is that there are two common pathways for you to understand the talk I'm about to give you. On one side of the slides, and I'll show it to you, are all the causes of inflammation that are making you sick. We know in Lyme disease there are inflammatory molecules that are called cytokines, okay? Both chemokines that attract your white cells and lymphocytes to the site of the infections. In fact, John Hopkins has done amazing research on CXCL9, CXCL10, CCL19, a marker for chronic Lyme disease based on John Alcott's work here at Hopkins. So there's chemokines and cytokines, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, interferon gamma. They have, fa they have fancy names. All it means is it's like creating a fire in your body. Those molecules are what make you tired, achy, the ones that give you joint pain, muscle pain, nerve pain. By the way, the hallmark of Lyme disease is migratory pain. Muscle pain, joint pain, and nerve pain that moves around your body without reason. How many people in the audience have had migratory pain? Okay, you're gonna see from the slides, you're almost right, 93% of our patients had migratory pain. Now everyone's looking for a test for Lyme disease. We need better diagnostics. I'm an internist. I take a history from patients. So I'm gonna show you the article we published validating the first validated Lyme screening questionnaire called the HMQ, the horowitz emsitz questionnaire. If you score over 63 on this questionnaire and you have migratory pain, you already are going towards the diagnosis, whether you have a positive ELISA or not, okay? These are all very important points. So you're gonna see from the slides, you've got to get to all the underlying sources of inflammation, sleep disorders, which raise interleukin-6, leaky gut and food allergies, right? Autoimmune, different infections, but then there's the downstream effects of what these infections and inflammation do to your body. They affect your pituitary gland, so it shuts off your hormones. I have men in their 20s coming in with low testosterone, like they're 80 years old. The men, the doctors, never look for it. We see women in early menopause. 70% had low adrenal function. Well, your adrenal is like your battery of your body. If you have the low battery, you're not gonna be able to fight the infections. So you've got to not only look for the sources of inflammation, sources with an S, but you've got to treat the downstream effects, the hormone disruption, the POTS dysautonomia, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It is a type of dysautonomia, neuropathy of your autonomic nervous system that controls your blood pressure and your pulse rate. And what that is, is for example, people that complain of fatigue, dizziness standing, palpitations, brain fog, anxiety. How many people in the audience have those symptoms have been diagnosed with POTS? Great, it's about 50%. That is missed by the majority of physicians. All you have to do is sitting and standing blood pressures and pulses, it's published in the articles I'm about to show you. Get to the sources of the inflammation, treat the downstream effects, but you can't just use the standard antibiotics for treating Lyme. Cell wall drugs, penicillin, cephalosporins, Bicillin, amoxicillin, augmentin, IV rocephin, ceftin, omniceph. That's only for replicating spirochetes for the log form. What are the ones that are in you that are keeping you sick? It's the round body forms, right? They call them cyst forms, L forms, S forms, cell wall deficient forms. It's the intracellular bacteria difficult to get to. That's what doxyrifampin dapsone, that's where it goes. And then there's the biofilm persister forms. And this is where we have hope for all of you because until the last five years, until I discovered Dapsone, I had patients I could not get across the finish line. And now I am regularly getting patients better where they no longer have to come back to see me. I'm probably the only doctor who doesn't want patients to come back and see me. <laughs> I'd like to go out of business and quickly, please. <laughs> Now that I've explained the whole talk, let me just show you exactly what it is. 
A couple of conflicts of interest. I have two books, as you heard about. I'm on the Zymogen board, stock and honorariums. The two studies I'm about to show you were from grants from Bay Area Lyme and the MSIDS Research Foundation. Uh, but the most important point is the views expressed in this presentation do not represent the viewpoints of HHS, of Health and Human Services, the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, or the United States. The lawyers for HHS told me I have to say that every time I give a public talk. And I'm sure those of you who know me would not think that anyone at HHS is going to accept all the views of what I'm about to tell you today, even though this is the truth, folks. It's the best truth I can give you based on hard science and based on doing this for 32 years. Here's the first study. Please take a picture of this. You're going to go online and you're going to read this study. This is in the International Journal of Medicine, just published six weeks ago. Precision Medicine, Retrospective Chart Review and Data Analysis of 200 Patients on Dapsone Combination Therapy for Chronic Lyme, Post-Treatment Lyme Disease Syndrome, Part 1. I did this with my colleague, Dr. Phyllis Freeman. Um, Dr. Freeman, by the way, has been, she was a PhD psychologist at the State University of New Paltz. All of the studies you've seen me publish in the last few years, if it was not for Dr. Freeman, I would not be able to publish this. She's been an invaluable resource for you and for the Lyme community. She's kind of been hidden behind the scenes, but I want you to know how important Phyllis has been in helping to get this published material out. The second study, this was published in Healthcare just four months ago. Precision Medicine, Part 2, the role of the MSIDS model in defining, diagnosing, and treating chronic Lyme, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, and other chronic illness. Now, why do I say other chronic illness? Here's some startling figures for you. 5% of the US population, 3.5 million patients, have chronic fatigue syndrome. 1.5 million have, chronic, have fibromyalgia. 5%. What is chronic fatigue fibro? Is there a test for chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia? No, there is not. Are the symptoms of chronic fatigue and fibro very similar to Lyme? <laughs> you are a well-educated audience. <laughs> fatigue, joint pain, muscle pain, headaches, I can't fall asleep at night, my memory is not working, I have POTS dysautonomia. Sound familiar? OK, that's at least. 5% of the US population. There's 23 million Americans with autoimmune illness. Lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, 23 million. First question, you know the answer. Does Lyme cause autoimmune phenomenon, yes or no? Yes. yes. Does mercury and heavy metals and environmental toxins like small particle pollution, asbestos and environmental toxins cause autoimmune disease? Yes. yes. Do changes in the microbiome of your gut, like Prevotella species and Clostridium affect rheumatoid arthritis and MS? Yeah. Yes. Are there genetic predispositions to it? Yes. Are there bacteria in your mouth that actually are associated with, at this point, Alzheimer's disease, Lyme disease, rheumatoid? Yes, the point being, every one of these diseases that is now costing the American healthcare systems billions and trillions of dollars, okay? 70% of the healthcare costs in this country are chronic disease, and over 80%, okay, of the deaths in this country are due to chronic disease. We don't have a common denominator and a model for chronic disease. Isn't that strange? So what is Alzheimer's? 46.5 million Americans have been diagnosed with preclinical Alzheimer's. So I've sent emails to HHS and I've sent, is anybody looking at these statistics? Because we know that they found spirochetes in the brains of Lyme patients. They've also, by the way, found H. pylori, the Helicobacter pylori, a spirochetal organism that makes its way up into the brain. They found Porphyromonas gingivalis bacteria from the teeth, from gingivitis that's made it up into the brain. They found herpes virus 1, herpes virus 2, herpes virus 6, herpes virus 7. They found pesticides published in JAMA Neurology four years ago. Is Alzheimer's disease possibly a multifactorial illness? And by the way, a biofilm-induced illness? The answer is yes, based on the literature. When you read the book, and most of you bought the new book, How Can I Get Better? When you look up the neurology chapter, I want you to look up all the multifactorial causes of Alzheimer's I just told you about for diseases that we supposedly have no answers for. There are answers. But we need to be able to get a group of people to do these type of studies and screen the population. That is what this is about, is not just for Lyme. 
It's for anyone with chronic disease, we need to take the 16-point MSIDS model and start applying it if we're really going to make a difference in healthcare in the United States, because it's about 17, 18% of our GDP is healthcare costs, and we're about 30th in the world at this point as far as how we do medicine. So why are we getting sick? Well, I think all of you know we lack adequate sensitivity for the tests. That's why you get diagnoses like chronic fatigue, fibro, autoimmune, neuropsychiatric illness with dementia. We know that Borrelia can persist in the body, but just as I've told you, there are persisters for Babesia, Bartonella, right? Tularemia, Mycoplasma, Brucella. So you've got to look at all of these infections for those of you who are still ill. And of course, the healthcare politics that we're trying to address at this point at HHS on this committee is that we can't ignore at this point the problems with diagnostics and persistence because it's increasing healthcare costs and it's increasing disability. So the approach that everyone is talking about in medicine is a personalized medical approach. There's not any one person in my office that's treated the same as someone else who comes in. One person may have Babesia, another one doesn't. Some people have Babesia and Bartonella, another one doesn't. They're all treated differently. So you have to have a personalized medicine approach, and that's what I'm using the 16-point MSIDS model for, and it works in clinical practice. It works in over 95% and sometimes we're surprised what we find. So one size does not fit all. That's why guidelines that may come out by, for example, the Infectious Disease Society of America talking about this, you can't possibly have guidelines that's going to have broad brushstrokes when what you individually need to do is screen people for all these 16 points on the MSIDS map and deal with it differently, right? That is really what it comes down to. So you can have broad-based guidelines but you're not really going to get able to give people individual treatment guidelines that are going to make a difference because everyone is going to be treated differently. So what we did in the second study is define, diagnose, and improve the treatment of Lyme by taking 200 of our sickest patients who did dapsone combination therapy. When I was at the HHS Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, one of the things that came up is, well, we know what post-treatment Lyme disease is. You get an erythema migraines rash, you treat it with some doxy, and then you go on and you have fatigue and pain and memory problems. We know how to define that. But what is chronic Lyme disease? What does it even mean, right? There's no one standardized definition. So what do I call it is, I don't call it necessarily chronic Lyme disease, I believe based on my experience in the literature, it is a chronic persistent infection. I call it Lyme MSIDS. Because what I'm finding is not just one reason why people are staying ill. Their adrenals are off, they're not falling asleep, they have food allergies, they have leaky gut, they have mast cell disorder with histamine, their Babesia hasn't been adequately treated. Yes, it's complex, but at the same hand, it's actually quite simple. All you have to do is go through this with your physician piece by piece to be able to figure out what parts of the model have not been adequately addressed. We wanted to also get the statistics to see what was the efficacy of dapsone combination therapy, and then show what are the abnormalities on the 16-point MSIDS map that are responsible for people getting sick, and what are the downstream effects. So this is what it actually looked like when you looked at all of the abnormalities. And these slides, by the way, these are also in the two published studies. You'll see this online. But what we found is over 70% of the time, people had not just infections, but immune dysfunction, low immunoglobulins, low subclasses, which are necessary to basically phagocytize, kind of eat the bacteria and get rid of it. We found toxins like mold and heavy metals. Um, certain amounts had mitochondrial dysfunction. That's the part of your body that makes energy that you need for brain function, cardiac function, neurological function. Endocrine, almost 100% of the people either had thyroid, adrenal, low testosterone. 40% had POTS, most of them not diagnosed by prior physicians because they kept trying to treat their fatigue and their brain fog and their palpitations and anxiety and dizziness using antibiotics. You don't treat POTS with antibiotics. You give salt, you give fluid, you give some licorice, you give midodrine, you give Florinef, you give Northera, Droxidopa. You do drugs that get people blood pressure up and I have a great example of a woman who was in a wheelchair for several years before seeing me. The doctor, she had seen about eight physicians, not one of them diagnosed her for POTS. Once I raised her blood pressure, she's now on a skating rink because she was a semi-professional skater and now she's back on the rink. 
and she has her life back. And it wasn't, it was treating the Lyme and the Bartonella and the Babesia, it was. But the POTS, if you don't bring up the blood pressure, you can't stand up and have a life because you can't perfuse your central nervous system, right? So it just makes sense that you need to do sitting and standing blood pressures and pulses, right? Here's the slide that's kind of explaining the whole approach that I was explaining to you early on. On one side of the slide are the primary sources of inflammation. Where are those inflammatory molecules coming from? It's the chronic infections like Borrelia and Babesia and Bart. It's dysbiosis of your intestinal bacteria. It's food allergies and leaky gut. It's not falling asleep, environmental toxins and mold, and then the downstream effects of this inflammatory response affecting your pituitary gland and your hormones. The mitochondria, which are in your body as the powerhouses of the cell, they don't have anything surrounding them when you have free radical oxidative stress, right? Your DNA has something around it called histones. It protects it from DNA damage, not the mitochondria. So a lot of patients do need mitochondrial regeneration when they're done with the antibiotics to see that that may be one of the factors of why the chronic fatigue may not be clearing, as well as candida, as well as a yeast overgrowth, because candida can also look like Lyme. It causes fatigue and pain and brain fog. This kind of a differential diagnosis, knowing symptoms and doing a differential diagnosis, is the essence of internal medicine of the way I was taught when I went to med school. And it's really what serves me as an internist, because if you keep going back to differential diagnosis, you will discover the causes of where the symptoms are. And since a lot of you have both of my books, you are getting them out front, you'll know that in both books, there's about 13 or 14 pages. And there's, for example, one symptom, right, dizziness. And then you can go look it up and you go, well, what are all the things that cause dizziness, right? Oh, well, that could be Lyme, that could be POTS, Right? Oh, but it could also be hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. Maybe mid-morning or mid-afternoon, you start yawning, you get very tired, you feel like you want to take a nap, you get palpitations and anxious. How many people have hypoglycemic swings in the middle of the morning and afternoon? That's yeah, probably about a third. That causes dizziness, right? But you also could have environmental toxins affecting your eighth nerve. You could have cerebellar problems. It's all about differential diagnosis. If you have sweats, it's about, is it menopause? Is it malaria? Is it Babesia? Is it hyperthyroidism? Do you have a cough at night with hemoptysis, blood? Is it tuberculosis? Do you have big lymph nodes with night sweats and weight loss? Is it non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Every symptom must have a differential diagnosis, and that's how you work with your physicians. And it's all laid out in the books, right? It's all there for you to work with your healthcare providers. The laboratories we used were national laboratories. Um, we used Quest, LabCorp, Bioreference, local labs, uh, specialty labs like Imugen, Igenix, MDL, Stony Brook, uh, Galaxy, Immunosciences, and a lot of the functional medicine laboratory like Aeron, Labrix, Genova. So it was a broad range of labs we used for these studies. And the reason we had to go very broad in looking at it is because, <laughs> yes, I knew you would like that slide. Um, <laughs> Insurers, unfortunately, a lot of times only accept two-tier testing. Doc, can you see the problem? Yes, I'm afraid so. So what do we do to make the diagnosis? So here's the study that I published about three years ago in the International Journal of Medicine, empirical validation of the horowitz emsitz questionnaire for suspected Lyme. We took 1,600 people, healthy and with Lyme. We looked at all of their symptoms, we looked at how many had migratory pain, how many had day sweats, night sweats, and chills, and we came up with a score. If you score over 63 on this questionnaire, you have a very high probability of having Lyme. A doctor can use that because we know the tests are not reliable. And as far as how unreliable, I'm about to show you exactly how unreliable with what we just published. But let me just show you what we found are the primary symptoms on this. So here were the factors called the HMQ, horowitz emsitz questionnaire factors. The first one was neuropathy. There is no other disease in medicine where nerve pain, tingling, numbness, burning, stabbing, there's no other disease in medicine where there's neuropathy that migrates around your body. It does not exist. Lyme disease is the only one. How do I know? I did a literature search, and I went through what causes migratory pain. You could have gonococcal arthritis, but it's not very likely. 
You could have inflammatory bowel like Crohn's. Early on, you can get it. You could have an acute case of hepatitis, right? You could have Reiter syndrome from a salmonella. It, yes, there are other things, but they're very unusual. The one that might be the closest would be lupus. Lupus has been reported to have migratory pain, but my problem is the patients that the doctors thought had lupus, who had, for example, a positive ANA, I kind of wonder whether some of them actually may have even had Lyme. But Lyme is the only one that causes migratory neuropathy. This is important to know. Cognitive dysfunction, how many things cause cognitive dysfunction in a 30 to a 40-year-old person? You got B12 deficiency. If you want to be fancy, you check a methylmalonic acid, which is the marker for occult B12. You check folic acid. You check your thyroids. You check for mercury and lead. You check for environmental toxins. But there's not a lot of things that cause 30 to 40-year-old people to say, I can't remember why I walked into the next room, and I have word-finding problems, and I can't remember my wife's name. I have to call her honey. Those things just don't happen to the average population, right? It just doesn't. Somebody here is laughing. Somebody has been called honey. I can see this. Um, so when you look at it, if you look at the constellation of symptoms, you have good and bad days, the symptoms come and go, you have migratory pain, you have day sweats, night sweats, and chills, you have cognitive dysfunction, you have musculoskeletal pain that's also often migrating around the body, you have unexplained fatigue when you've done a differential diagnosis, you have dysautonomia, right, which has been associated with Lyme. This is the second article in the literature, medical literature, to talk about this. And even cardiorespiratory, where you might have chest pain. By the way, that chest pain that many of you get, that's costochondritis. That's inflammation in the chest wall. You're not dying from a heart attack, right? Not to say if you don't have cardiac risk factors with high cholesterol, being a smoker, right, you shouldn't get checked. But when you press on the chest wall, most of the Lyme patients will say their chest pain basically gets worse and gets better. It's costochondritis. Rarely will we see a pericarditis. Lyme can affect all of the different parts of the heart, endocarditis, myocarditis, pericarditis, but it's not that common. Take a look at the number of people in our study with erythema migrans rashes. Now, John Hopkins has John Alcott's SLICE study here, which are the people with PTLDS. Those people all had erythema migrans rashes. Look at the number of people in the study that had EM rash, less than 20%. 81% of my patients never saw a bullseye rash. And I think most of you know, half the time it looks like a bullseye and half of the time it's a spreading red rash. Be careful with the differential. Oh, it was a spider bite. Oh, it's a cellulitis, right? Be careful with this one. There is a way to do a differential on this also. But you'll notice, and this is really important take home message. A lot of the doctors, when you get a CDC positive IgM Western blot, right? 2339, 2341, 3941. What did the doctor say? Oh, that's a false positive. You only see it in early Lyme. Ah, wrong answer. IgM Western blots are seen in chronic Lyme. In fact, it's one of the most reliable markers of chronic Lyme. Now, guess who else published that? John Alcott from John Hopkins University. Go look up the work by Allison Redman and Alcott several years ago in clinical rheumatology showing the exact same figure of 45%. IgM positive CDC Western blots. In our study, it was about 10, 11% with IgG Western blots, right? Not a lot of people, but look at the ELISAs, 20%, immunofluorescent antibodies, 10%, C6 ELISAs, 10, 12%, the Ella spot, even worse. Now let's, let's dive down a little bit. The local labs, like Quest LabCorp, do they report all the bands on the Western blight, like the 31 and 34 OSPE, OSB? Yes or no? no? No. You guys are very educated. The only reason we got this data is I took 200 patients, and I think it was about 700 Western blots, because they had had the Western blots repeated. We put in every band on every Western blot in these 200 people. And I'll, what we came up with is, in the IgM, the 31 was over 40% of the time, right? And the 34, about 20%. Now, why is this important? The OSPE 31, it is true that you can get a viral transmigration of proteins with viruses Epstein-Barr. It's true it can happen. Happen often? No. But does it happen? Yes. But when we looked at the IgG, right, 31 and 34 also, again, you're seeing it somewhere in the 10 to 20% range. Now, the five band criteria by the CDC, do they include the 31 and 34? 
No, they don't. Yet, the 31 is a very specific marker for Lyme. IGENIX Laboratories just came out with their immunoblot, right? So the problem with the Western blots is most of the commercial Western blots use the B31 strain, right? It's a strain that's out there, but it's not, it's more of a lab strain. It's out there in the environment. But the original Western blot from IGENIX, the reason I've used it for so many years, is they use two strains. They use the 297 and the B31. So when I look at their Western blots, the bands show up better, right? Really specific bands. Now, if you're a sick patient and you have good and bad days and your symptoms are coming and going and you have migratory nerve pain and you have a 31 or a 34 band on your Western blot, doesn't that have significance? How did you possibly get a Borrelia specific band in your Western blot if you've never been exposed to a Borrelia species? Now, the problem is there's more than one Borrelia species making people sick. They're called Borrelia sensu latu. That is the group of Borrelia species that are making people sick. So, for example, Borrelia abzeli, which is in Europe, it causes a rash called acrodermatitis, chronic amatrophicans. I would like you all to repeat that three times fast. <laughs> there's Borrelia garini that causes neuroborreliosis. In California, they're finding Bob Lane. They named it after him. Borrelia lani, right? There's the relapsing fever Borrelia, Borrelia hermsi, right, and Borrelia miyamoto. You've got these Borrelia species that can overlap with bands on the Western blot, but they're not all Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto. But that doesn't mean you've not been exposed with Borreliosis. The immunoblot from IgenX takes all of the sensu latu strains and puts them on the blots. So if you've been exposed to another Borrelia species, it'll show up better. So if you've not been able to get positive tests, and you've just used local, use the IgM IgG from MyGenix, but if you still have not been able to get positive tests, use the immunoblot, because you may be able to capture some of these other strains. When we went further and we looked at, well, how many people actually were CDC positive on their Western blots, but ELISA negative, you'll notice in the first slide there in the top, it was about 3% had a positive CDC Western blot, but were negative ELISA, but 14% were negative C6 ELISA. Now, what's surprising about that is the C6 is supposed to pick up other strains of Borrelia, like Abzeli and Garini, not just Borrelia burgdorferi. It turned out, in our, at least in our study, to be worse. And you'll notice in the Western blot for the IgM, it's even more. 22% were ELISA negative, yet they had a positive CDC Western blot, and 46% of the C6 ELISA were negative but there was a positive IgM CDC positive Western blot, which I'm now telling you has significance. This is not a false positive. And the reason it's not a false positive, I'm about to show this to you. Nicole Baumgarth, I'll show you the study in a few minutes. In mice, she showed that when Borrelia invades the lymph nodes of mice, it gets rid of the part of the lymph nodes called the germinal centers where you make, where your B cells make antibodies, where they make IgG antibodies, which are your most effective antibodies. On the outside is where you make your IgM antibodies. So what happened in the mice, when Borrelia invaded, there were no IgG antibodies. That's why you can't get IgG Western blots that are positive, and that's why you get so many IgM that are positive. I'll show you the exact same results in the human population, and this is the first time it's been published. As I told you earlier, please expand your Babesia testing. Don't just check for Babesia microti. Check for well one duncani as well as all of these other infections, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Q Fever, Tularemia. Now, in my book, I have all of these different infections and all the different tests that you can do if you're suspecting that it's there. But the reason you want to get this early is, for example, there are children who die from Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever every year because the doctors don't recognize it. The rash of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever may not show up in 10% of the population. And day six, you may get that classic rash on the hands and the soles of the feet. You've got to treat this thing early by day six so the kids can die. And I learned about this because when I was speaking to the CDC as co-chair of the other tick-borne infections, I realized how many children, right? Children are the number one group now getting Lyme in the United States that we're concerned about, but they're also dying from these other tick-borne infections. So low white cell counts, low platelet counts, elevated liver functions. You'll see it with Ehrlichia. You'll see it with Anaplasma. You'll see it with Rickettsia, like Rocky Mountain Q fever. You'll even see it with Borrelia miyamotoi, this relapsing fever Borrelia. So what's nice is if you go into a doctor and you're sick with fevers and chills and aches and pains and horrible headaches, low white cell count, 
low platelet count, elevated liver, any one of those combos, your doctor better get you on doxycycline ASAP. Now, the other thing, and this is not yet proven, but this is where this is going to go based on the research by Dr. Feng from Hopkins I'm about to show you. When you get infected with a tick, the question is, for the people that fail early doxy, is it because there were biofilm forms, persister forms that are injected, that were in the mid-gut or the salivary glands of the tick that got into your body? And should we be using essential oils and biofilm busters from the very beginning? I'll show you why I think this is probably the next step for early Lyme treatment, because there's no harm and there may be great benefit. Take a look at the number of co-infections we found in the study. About two-thirds of the patients had between five and eight co-infections. Anaplasma ehrlichia, about 14%. Bartonella was almost 50%, mostly Hensile, some Quintana. Now, I really don't know how many people had Bartonella because there were over 38 species and subspecies of Bartonella, and I cannot use Galaxy Laboratories in New York. So I actually don't really know how many people truthfully have BART. I will do a VGF, a vascular endothelial growth factor, as an indirect marker of BART. I'll ask about pain in the bottom of the feet, big lymph nodes, new onset of a seizure disorder, bad eye problems, right? I'll look for some of the classic signs, granulomas, kind of these very painful nodules that appear sometimes. You can look for it, but I have to tell you, I suspect that there are a lot of Bartonella species like the Vinsone and Burkhoffi species talked about Ed Breischwert. I suspect that many of you that are here, yay Ed, for many of you who are here who can't find answers, please get your tested through Galaxy. Get a Bartonella fish from Igenix. Go after the Bart. The Dapsone protocol I am about to show you is knocking out, as far as I can tell, the Lyme pretty effectively and people, as long as the 16 points have been done correctly, the problem I'm having is with resistant Babesia and Bartonella. So please, take home message from today. If you're still sick, go after the Bart. All the different subspecies and species, you really got to go after it. It seems to be one of those pathogens. And I actually had to convince, I was co-chair of the other tick-borne committee, they didn't even want to include Bartonella as a pathogen on the committee. I had to convince them. I got to choose half of the committee, and Alan got to choose the other half. So I chose Barna Erickson from the University of Minnesota, who's a derm researcher. And I've sent two of my patients. She did skin biopsies on two of my patients who were still ill, who had those classic stretch marks, those striae. Guess what she found in the skin of these people after chronic antibiotics? Active Lyme and active Bartonella by derm, by confocal microscopy and using immunofluorescence. So Marna Erickson is also confocal microscopy. Some of these new techniques to discover BART, that's also some of the forefront of what we need to do here. But you'll notice that you've got to look for all these co-infections. Q fever, 10%. Now, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, it's interesting. If you look at our committee report from HHS, 10% of the US population has titers for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. But that doesn't mean they've all been exposed. It cross-reacts. That's exactly the same figure we found here. But Babesia? Over things. You check for mercury and lead. You check for environmental toxins. But there's not a lot of things that cause 30 to 40 year old people to say, I can't remember why I walked into the next room and I have word finding problems and I can't remember my wife's name. I have to call her honey. Those things just don't happen to the average population, right? It just doesn't. Somebody here is laughing. Somebody has been called honey. I can see this. Um, so when you look at it, if you look at the constellation of symptoms, you have good and bad days. The symptoms come and go, you have migratory pain, you have day sweats, night sweats, and chills, you have cognitive dysfunction, you have musculoskeletal pain that's also often migrating around the body, you have unexplained fatigue when you've done a differential diagnosis, you have dysautonomia, right, which has been associated with Lyme. This is the second article in the literature, medical literature, to talk about this. And even cardiorespiratory, where you might have chest pain. By the way, that chest pain that many of you get, that's costochondritis. That's inflammation in the chest wall. You're not dying from a heart attack, right? Not to say if you don't have cardiac risk factors with high cholesterol, being a smoker, right, you shouldn't get checked. But when you press on the chest wall, most of the Lyme patients will say their chest pain basically gets worse and gets better. It's costochondritis. Rarely will we see a pericarditis. Lyme can affect all of the different parts of the heart, endocarditis, myocarditis, pericarditis, but it's not that common. Take a look at the number of people in our study with erythema migrans rashes. Now, John Hopkins has 
John Alcott's SLICE study here, which are the people with PTLDS. Those people all had erythema migrans rashes. Look at the number of people in the study that had EM rash, less than 20%. 81% of my patients never saw a bullseye rash. And I think most of you know, half the time it looks like a bullseye and half of the time it's a spreading red rash. Be careful with the differential. Oh, it was a spider bite. Oh, it's a cellulitis, right? Be careful with this one. There is a way to do a differential on this also. But you'll notice, and this is really important take home message. A lot of the doctors, when you get a CDC positive IgM Western blot, right? 2339, 2341, 3941. What do the doctors say? Oh, that's a false positive. You only see it in early Lyme. Ah, wrong answer. IgM Western blots are seen in chronic Lyme. In fact, it's one of the most reliable markers of chronic Lyme. Now, guess who else published that? John Alcott from John Hopkins University. Go look up the work by Allison Redman and Alcott several years ago in clinical rheumatology showing the exact same figure of 45% IgM positive CDC Western blots. In our study, it was about 10, 11% with IgG Western blots, right? Not a lot of people, but look at the ELISAs, 20%, immunofluorescent antibodies, 10%, C6 elizas, 10, 12%, the Ellis spot, even worse. Now let's, let's dive down a little bit. The local labs, like Quest LabCorp, do they report all the bands on the Western blight, like the 31 and 34 OSP A, OSP B? Yes or no? no? No, you guys are very educated. The only reason we got this data is I took 200 patients and I think it was about 700 Western blots because they had had their Western blots repeated. We put in every band on every Western blot in these 200 people. And I'll, what we came up with is in the IgM, the 31 was over 40% of the time, right? And the 34, about 20%. Now, why is this important? The OSPE 31, it is true that you can get a viral transmigration of proteins with viruses Epstein-Barr. It's true it can happen. Happen often? No. But does it happen? Yes. But when we looked at the IgG, right, 31 and 34 also again, you're seeing it somewhere in the 10 to 20% range. Now, the five band criteria by the CDC, do they include the 31 and 34? No, they don't. Yet the 31 is a very specific marker for Lyme. IgenX Laboratories just came out with their immunoblot. Right? So the problem with the Western blots is most of the commercial Western blots use the B31 strain. Right? It's a strain that's out there, but it's not, it's more of a lab strain. It's out there in the environment. But the original Western blot from Igenix, the reason I've used it for so many years, is they use two strains. They use the 297 and the B31. So when I look at their Western blots, the bands show up better, right? Really a specific bands. Now, if you're a sick patient, and you have good and bad days, and your symptoms are coming and going, and you have migratory nerve pain, and you have a 31 or a 34 band on your Western blot, doesn't that have significance? How did you possibly get a Borrelia-specific band in your Western blot if you've never been exposed to a Borrelia species? Now, the problem is there's more than one Borrelia species making people sick. They're called Borrelia sensu latu. That is the group of Borrelia species that are making people sick. So for example, Borrelia abzeli, which is in Europe, it causes a rash called acrodermatitis, chronic amitrophicans. I would like you all to repeat that three times fast. <laughs> There's Borrelia garini that causes neuroborreliosis. In California, they're finding Bob Lane. They named it after him. Borrelia lanei, right? There's the relapsing fever Borrelia, Borrelia hermsi, right? And Borrelia miyamotoi. You've got these Borrelia species that can overlap with bands on the Western blot, but they're not all Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto. But that doesn't mean you've not been exposed with Borreliosis. The immunoblot from Igenex takes all of the sensu latu strains and puts them on the blots. So if you've been exposed to another Borrelia species, it'll show up better. So if you've not been able to get positive tests and you've just used local, use the IgM IgG from Igenex, but if you still have not been able to get positive tests, use the immunoblot because you may be able to capture some of these other strains. When we went further and we looked at, well, how many people actually were CDC positive on their Western blots, but ELISA negative, you'll notice in the first slide there in the top, it was about 3% 
had a positive CDC Western blot, but were negative ELISA, but 14% were negative C6 ELISA. Now, what's surprising about that is the C6 is supposed to pick up other strains of Borrelia, like Abzelli and Garini, not just Borrelia burgdorferi. It turned out, in our, at least in our study, to be worse. And you'll notice in the Western blot for the IgM, it's even more. 22% were ELISA negative, yet they had a positive CDC Western blot, and 46% of the C6 ELISA were negative, but there was a positive IgM CDC positive Western blot, which I'm now telling you has significance. This is not a false positive. And the reason it's not a false positive, I'm about to show this to you. Nicole Baumgarth, I'll show you the study in a few minutes. In mice, she showed that when Borrelia invades the lymph nodes of mice, it gets rid of the part of the lymph nodes called the germinal centers where you make, where your B cells make antibodies where they make IgG antibodies, which are your most effective antibodies. On the outside is where you make your IgM antibodies. So what happened in the mice, when Borrelia invaded, there were no IgG antibodies. That's why you can't get IgG Western blots that are positive, and that's why you get so many IgM that are positive. I'll show you the exact same results in the human population, and this is the first time it's been published. As I told you earlier, Please expand your Babesia testing. Don't just check for Babesia microti. Check for Wall 1 duncani, as well as all of these other infections, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Q Fever, Tularemia. Now, in my book, I have all of these different infections and all the different tests that you can do if you're suspecting that it's there. But the reason you want to get this early is, for example, there are children who die from Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever every year because the doctors don't recognize it. The rash of Rocky Mountain spotted fever may not show up in 10% of the population. And day six, you may get that classic rash on the hands and the soles of the feet. You've got to treat this thing early by day six so the kids can die. And I learned about this because when I was speaking to the CDC as co-chair of the other tick-borne infections, I realized how many children, right? Children are the number one group now getting Lyme in the United States that we're concerned about, but they're also dying from these other tick-borne infections. So low white cell counts, low platelet counts, elevated liver functions, you'll see it with Ehrlichia, you'll see it with Anaplasma, you'll see it with Rickettsia, like Rocky Mountain Q fever, you'll even see it with Borrelia miyamotoi, this relapsing fever Borrelia. So what's nice is if you go into a doctor and you're sick with fevers and chills and aches and pains and horrible headaches, low white cell count, low platelet count, elevated liver, any one of those combos, your doctor better get you on doxycycline ASAP. Now, the other thing, and this is not yet proven, but this is where this is going to go based on the research by Dr. Feng from Hopkins I'm about to show you. When you get infected with a tick, the question is, for the people that fail early doxy, is it because there are biofilm forms, persister forms that are injected that were in the mid-gut or the salivary glands of the tick that got into your body? And should we be using essential oils and biofilm busters from the very beginning? I'll show you why I think this is probably the next step for early Lyme treatment, because there's no harm and there may be great benefit. Take a look at the number of co-infections we found in the study. About two-thirds of the patients had between five and eight co-infections. Anaplasma lichia, about 14%. Bartonella, was almost 50%, mostly Hensile, some Quintana. Now, I really don't know how many people had Bartonella because there were over 38 species and subspecies of Bartonella, and I cannot use Galaxy Laboratories in New York. So I actually don't really know how many people truthfully have Bart. I will do a VGF, a vascular endothelial growth factor, as an indirect marker of Bart. I'll ask about pain in the bottom of the feet, big lymph nodes, new onset of a seizure disorder, bad eye problems, right? I'll look for some of the classic signs, granulomas, kind of these very painful nodules that appear sometimes. You can look for it, but I have to tell you, I suspect that there are a lot of Bartonella species like the Vinsone and Burkhoffi species talked about Ed Breischwert. I suspect that many of you that are here, yay Ed, for many of you who are here who can't find answers, please get your tested through Galaxy. Get a Bartonella fish from Igenix. Go after the Bart. The Dapsone protocol I am about to show you is knocking out, as far as I can tell the line, pretty effectively in people as long as the 16 points have been done correctly. The problem I'm having is with resistant Babesia and Bartonella. So please, take home message from today. If you're still sick, go after the Bart. 
all the different subspecies and species, you really got to go after it. It seems to be one of those pathogens. And I actually had to convince, I was co-chair of the other tick-borne committee, they didn't even want to include Bartonella as a pathogen on the committee. I had to convince them. I got to choose half of the committee, and Alan got to choose the other half. So I chose Marna Erickson from the University of Minnesota, who is a derm researcher. And I've sent two of my patients she did skin biopsies on two of my patients who were still ill, who had those classic stretch marks, those striae. Guess what she found in the skin of these people after chronic antibiotics? Active Lyme and active Bartonella. By derm, by confocal microscopy and using immunofluorescence. So Marna Erickson is also confocal microscopy. Some of these new techniques to discover BART, that's also some of the forefront of what we need to do here. But you'll notice that you've got to look for all these co-infections, Q fever, 10%. Now, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, it's interesting. If you look at our committee report from HHS, 10% of the US population has titers for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. But that doesn't mean they've all been exposed. It cross-reacts. That's exactly the same figure we found here. But Babesia, over 50% by titer. But when you included PCR fish, it was over 80%, right? And then we had all of these viruses. And Six and a half percent had West Nile. Now, why is West Nile important to me? West Nile is what's called a flavivirus. Dengue fever, West Nile, Zika virus, Powassan encephalitis, deer tick virus. Why am I concerned about flavoviruses? They persist. So here's the problem, and we don't know the answer. When you look for how many people have been exposed to these co-infections? You're going to find, as I said, a whole host of Anaplasma, Babesia, Bartonella. And again, for those of you looking for answers, you need to go after these. But what we didn't check in our patients, and this got cut off, what we didn't check is Powassan. There were two studies published by Connie Knox from Cope Laboratories on Powassan. She looked in Lyme endemic areas, which you are here and in Maryland and where you're living, and she was Wisconsin and New York and the rest. And what she found is it was around 11 to 16% of the people living in Lyme endemic areas are now testing positive for exposure to the Powassan virus. Now, they're not all getting Powassan encephalitis, right? It's like West Nile. It's about one out of 150 that come down with these really bad neurological effects. My concern, however, is this turning out to be a chronic persistent viral infection? Because that's what flavoviruses can do. We don't know the answer. It's one of those big questions that came out of the co-infection report. And that's why I'm encouraging you all to read it, because it's a great way to kind of update your knowledge base. But this is something I'm concerned about. And that is why take home message today, please don't ever go out without tick prevention, right? Avon Skin So Soft, IR3535 on your skin. It's an amino acid. It's even safe in pregnant women. They've used it for like decades in Europe. Picoridin, right, safe, right? Using permethrin on your clothes, doing tick checks. You, you know the routine. But it's also viruses and stuff also in mosquitoes now, folks. You can't just imagine that it's safe going out. You must wear tick and mosquito protection whenever you go out. You must protect yourselves, your family, and your children. This is just standard. This is how you now go outside. I beg of you, please do this, because the Powassan numbers you're seeing here, if you happen to be one of the unlucky individual that gets Powassan encephalitis, you don't really have a great chance. It's over 50%. You're going to have residual neurological problems, and people die from it. We had several people die in New York, not far, actually, from where I live. Here's the story with Babesia. I told you early, don't just check for Babesia microti. Check for WA1, Duncani. You'll notice about equal numbers. About 10% of those patients had both. But you'll notice the Babesia fish, that RNA test showed up in quite a few people, right? So here's the way it looked. There were more patients with Babesia duncani than microti in the study. That's surprising. Second surprising thing is that among the patients who didn't test positive by serology, by antibody, about a third of them, right, were fish positive. So that's why you have to use the FISH test as a screening test for Babesia. It's only done at this point through Igenix laboratories, and I have no commercial, uh, you know, there's nothing that links me with Igenix, right? You have to do these tests because they're the only lab that actually does the FISH test at this point for Babesia, and we have found it to be really crucial in making a diagnosis in some people that are seronegative. Then the question came up, 
has Babesia duncani while one spread to the northeastern United States? Well, if you look at the numbers in the east coast and the south coast, right, in the Midwest, you're going to notice there's numbers all over. Take a look at the map. So it's no longer WA1 was Washington 1, right? It's no longer just California, Washington. We're now seeing in Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, Wisconsin, Michigan, Maine. 6%, by the way, were in Maine. What's interesting about that is there was an article published by uh, Dr. Scott in Healthcare several months before our article came out, where on the Nova Scotia coast, they're now discovering Babesia. Um, Duncani, right, while one. So the Nova Scotia coast is 200 miles from Maine. And 6% of the patients in our study were right living in Maine. So it actually, it made actually a lot of sense, right, that it has spread. But again, I will say the CDC is still going to need to take some of these samples to prove, in fact, because there are a lot of other Babesia species like um, MO1, Missouri 1, K01, Korea 1. There's Babesia divergent in Europe. There's actually a lot of Babesia species just like there are Bartonella species and Borrelia, you have to get used to the fact that there are a lot of species that may not all be picked up on standard testing. This is a real big take home message, right, of why you have to go really broad when you're looking for this. Here's a really important point of the article. I don't think this surprises most of you, but is Lyme a persistent infection? Well, 14.5% of our patients were DNA positive despite adequate antibiotic therapies for months or years prior to using dapsone combination therapy. Babesia species, they were PCR, DNA, fish, RNA positive, despite using clindamycin and quinine, despite using mepron and zithromax, the classic drug regimens for Babesia. Now, 20 years ago, I did this study and I presented it at Karen Forshton's meeting at the uh, Lyme Disease Foundation showing that we had positive chronic persistent Babesia, whether I use clind clindamycin and quinine or mepron and zithromax 20 years ago. It's turning out to be exactly the same years later. And I told HHS and I told the CDC and everyone, you have got to put money into research for better Babesia treatments because Mepron no longer is working. And it especially doesn't work for Babesia duncani. It's not that it doesn't help. It doesn't, not, not that it doesn't knock it down, but it does not eliminate it, at least not in my patient population. What happens is, oh doc, I have drenching night sweats. I have drenching day sweats. You give them Mepron and Zithromax, maybe with some Bactrim works well with Bactrim, maybe with some artemisinin, maybe with some cryptolepis, right? Combine the herbs, do all this together. Maybe even with clindamycin. Clinda, Mepron, Zithromax, Bactrim, artemisinin, crypto, right? I'm combining my anti-malarial drugs. Do people say they feel better? Absolutely. I stop the drugs, do the sweats come back? Yes. Are they as bad as where they were? No. What's happening with most of these treatments is we're knocking down the load of the organisms, but we're not eliminating them completely. But the good news is, if you keep going after it, you eventually win, at least in most people, if you have a well-functioning immune system. And I'm going to show you the problems with the immune system in just a second. Now, these treatment failures that we found, and by the way, as I told you, it wasn't just Lyme Babesia, it was Bartonella, it was Tularemia, where titers went up, it was Brucella, and then we found Mycoplasma species like Mycoplasma fermentans, Mycoplasma penetrans. So a lot of different intracellular, and this is the key point, intracellular bacteria. Lyme is inside the cells, Ehrlichia anaplasma is inside the cells, Rocky Mountain Q fever inside the cells, Tularemia is inside the cells, Brucella, Bartonella. These are intracellular pathogens. What does Doxy do? Goes inside the cells. What does Rifampin do? Goes inside the cells. What does Dapsone do? It's a triple intracellular, right? You got to go in there and hit these multiple intracellular pathogens in the sickest patients. That's how you get them better. Now, is this new that we've never seen treatment failures? No, it's been published in the medical literature, right? Dr. Klempner had shown years ago that if you took a vat of rocephin and you took fibroblasts from the skin and they had Lyme and you stuck it in a vat of rocephin for 14 days and you pulled them out, the spirochetes were still alive. The fibroblasts of the skin protected the spirochetes. This is all published, by the way, this is the same doctor who did the first NIH double-blind placebo-controlled study, which, by the way, I participated in. If you look up the New England Journal, you'll see my name as one of the participating doctors. I picked him up from the airport. At that time, I was taking Polaroid pictures of EM rashes. He was like drooling over all my charts with these EM rashes because he couldn't get people to sign up for the, for the study at the time. Preac, Mersic, Meyer, it can be in the eye. The ligaments, you don't get a lot of great blood flow in the ligaments, it can hide there. Deep in the joints, in the endothelial cells and macrophages, 
This is, by the way, one of the places, I think, again, intracellular, where the bugs are hiding, that you've got to use multiple intracellular drugs and biofilm agents that open up the biofilms to get this in there, while using, by the way, plaquenil hydroxychloroquine that alkalizes the intracellular compartment. There were studies years ago on Q fever, which is a persister bacteria. It's a, right, it's a rickettsial organism. It's a bioterrorist agent, but transmitted by ticks. right? And they use hydroxychloroquine, plaquenil. Dr. Dante has been using it for years. What it does is, apart from hitting the round body cystic forms of Lyme and hitting DNA gyrase of how the bug reproduces, it alkalizes the intracellular compartment to make these drugs more effective. That's part of the reason that this dapsone combination therapy I'm going to talk to you about is plaquenil with doxy and rifampin and dapsone. That's why plaquenil has been added. And it modulates autoimmunity, just like dapsone does, right? So we know that it's been persisting. Dr. Coyle, Dr. Liegner, you may know the unfortunate case um, of Vicky, the nurse, right, who had ongoing Lyme for years. One of the insurance companies whose name I will not mention stopped her antibiotics prematurely. And she died. They did brain biopsies and spinal fluid, and the spirochetes were still alive. The CDC and the NIH were in on this one. That's why it surprises me a little bit with the politics, because you guys got to see this yourself in a nurse right, who died despite years of antibiotics. But what did we not know about years ago? Biofilms. This is the key in the last five years of what I have learned and what I have done that is making a huge difference for the Lyme community and for the sickest patients. Dr. Shopey, Dr. McDonald, and it even goes back to Garth Ehrlich. If you look up Garth Ehrlich years ago, he was one of the first doctors to talk about biofilms in the ears of kids where they said, oh no, there's no bacteria in that cirrusotitis, right? It's some virus or something. Oh, it was bacteria, but they were in biofilms. The strep pneumonia and the Haemophilus influenza and, and the moxarella, all those bacteria were in biofilms, and that's why you couldn't cure those kids who had otitis media. Biofilms create sinus infections. Enos and three doctors know this. Biofilms create problems with prostatitis in men, creates problems with C. diff. Diarrhea creates problems with salmonella, with candida. Biofilms create a lot of problems, and unfortunately, it's been ignored by the medical community at large, and yet it's been published in literature for decades. So with persistence, and I think many of you know these studies, there's a study called Xenodiagnostics, where they took uninfected ticks, they put them on mice, right? They gave them Lyme, treated them, and then looked to see could we find any of these bacteria in the ticks later on? And the answer is yes. What they found is eight months after completion of treatment in the mice, there was RNA transcriptions of genes. Here's my question for you. Does dead DNA transcribe genes? No. So there's this theory, oh, that DNA, those PCRs that are positive, it's dead DNA. There's a problem with that. Anyone here been pregnant? Great. Within 36 hours of pregnancy, when fetal DNA starts to get into the bloodstream of the mother, it's taken away by the spleen. You don't have DNA that's kind of roaming around in your bloodstream. Now, that's not to say you can't get PCRs and DNA deep in tissues, right? It's possible. But you don't get DNA just roaming around in the blood. The spleen clears it. You definitely don't get RNA transcription of genes. Monic Embers, magnificent work, right? She's done two macaque embers study. She, she's done wonderful work on the macaque monkey showing persistence of Lyme, intact metabolically active Borrelia burgdorferi, disseminated infections. You should take a look at her work, really brilliant work. Um, and Adriana Marquez, who I sat recently at a conference next to, had done the post-treatment Lyme disease study confirming evidence of DNA in one of the patients. But if you read the report at the end of it, did it say that, hmm, we found persistent DNA that could mean chronic persistent infection. No, that was not. It was like, ooh, that's interesting. We could do interesting stuff putting ticks on people. Um, Lyme politics has a very broad effect as far as how medical literature is published. So here's the data mining. Here's what we found in these 200 people. High Babesia, high Bartonella high mycoplasma, a lot of tularemia, some brucella. Over 70% of the people had immune dysfunction, positive anti-nuclear antibodies, rheumatoid factors. They were HLA-DR2 or 4 positive, which is that genetic marker that makes you much sicker. 
right? You get Lyme, you tend to get Herxes that are much worse. Alan Steer has actually done wonderful work on that particular area. But here's what's really interesting about what we found with the immune system. 13% of the people had elevated IgM antibodies. 85% hmm. had some form of immune deficiency. 20, over 20% 20 had low IgG antibodies. As I told you earlier, you can't clear infections if you don't have IgG antibodies being made by your B cells that make antibodies. Almost 20% had low IgM. Now, why might you have a low IgM? I just told you that 45% of our patients had CDC positive IgM Western blots. So why would they have a low IgM? Well, first of all, it's being formed in antibody antigen complexes. Right? Your antibodies are linking to the antigen, and it's being taken out of the blood. Steve Schutzer published on this in Lancet in 1990 with the IgG antibodies. There's no reason this could not be happening in Lyme disease. And then we found IgA deficiency, which puts you at a higher risk for food allergies, which is important because if you have multiple food allergies with leaky gut, it causes the same inflammatory cytokine production that you get with Lyme. And that's why cleaning up your diet going gluten-free, dairy-free, cleaning it up, and making sure you're not eating allergic foods, making sure you don't have histamine triggers, really important. I can't even emphasize enough the importance of proper diet, even if you don't think you have a gluten problem or you're allergic. The problem is the IgE antibodies that you do only checks immediate food sensitivities. You need to do IgG, which is delayed hypersensitivities, and even then you may not pick them all up. You need to do a food trial just off the most allergic foods of eggs and nuts and shellfish and see how you feel, and especially histamine. The last thing for my wife, right, was actually discovering that she had mast cell activation. One morning I wake up and my wife is on the floor in the kitchen vomiting her brains out with a migraine. And I said, honey, what did you eat? <laughs> Nothing. I said, come on. <laughs> well, you know, yesterday I had some bone broth. I said, do you know that bone broth is a histamine trigger? It's aged meats? She said, no. I said, please get off histamine. Within 24 hours, the migraine she'd been suffering from went away. The chronic abdominal pain she'd been having for years went away. The only time it comes back is when she's off her diet. There's a fair number of people that are probably walking around with what's called pathogen-induced PI mast cell activation, P-I-M-C-A-S, Path pathogen right infection mast cell activation disorder. It means Lyme is actually causing mast cell in some of these people. So what is mast cell? Take a patient, pick up their arm, write, for example, R for Richard, write it on the forearm. It's called dramatographism. If you get the letter R, whatever your initial is, that comes up within like seven to 10 seconds as a wheel coming up off the skin, you are releasing histamine from your basophils and the mast cells in your skin. It's a very easy way to tell how histamine sensitive. Now, I'm so histamine sensitive, my wife can write my name on my back and it'll turn out Richard within 15 seconds, okay? I have no longer have to use my asthma medications if I stay away from histamine foods. Asthma, allergic rhinitis, all of these things are linked up to histamine. It's a large part of the population. So you have to be very, very careful with this. Now, take a look at the immunoglobulins. You'll notice subclasses one and three on this list were very low. Let me explain to you why this is important. Total IgG deficiency was 20%, almost 20% with IgM. But what happened is, is that 85% had low subclasses, and especially one and three. Why is subclass one and three on your immunoglobulin levels important? And some of you, by the way, may never have had this tested. They showed in early Lyme, when you get an EM rash and you have early Lyme, what are the subclasses that come up so that your immune system can fight and get rid of the infection? Subclasses one and three. What did we find in the people with chronic Lyme, or what I call Lyme MSIDs? Low subclass one and three. So what does subclass one and three do? It is important for phagocytosis, the ability to eat those bacteria and get rid of it and help with your complement system to also destroy the bacteria. Some of those people did not respond to a pneumococcal vaccine. They didn't make antibodies. And a lot of these people had chronic variable immune deficiency. So this is exactly what Nicole Baumgarth found in mice, where the IgG antibodies were affected when Borrelia invaded the lymph nodes. What she found in mice was an IgM skewed profile, exactly what we found in these 45% of people 
who had positive CDC IgM and Western blots and also high levels of IgM antibodies and low levels of IgM, probably because what we were dealing with, again, is antibody antigen complexes. So again, 85% had subclass deficiencies. One in three are necessary to get rid of Lyme. And these are really important, uh, these IgG1 and 3 for complement activation, opsonizing, phagocytosis, eating the bacteria, trying to get rid of it. They hypothesized that it's the high 1 and 3 early in the disease that allows you to get rid of Lyme. So really not so surprising, but this is the first time it's been published in the literature. I'm actually shocked that I was the first one to data mine these 657 volumes of charts and find this, right? So a lot of these patients had chronic variable immune, up to 7% had chronic variable immune deficiency. You're not gonna get rid of infections, right? Unless you're basically using IVIG. Some people had autoimmune encephalopathy, they had anti-dopaminergic antibodies, right, on Cunningham panels, they needed IVIG. Some of them on nerve biopsies had small fiber neuropathy, they needed IVIG. So a study that was published, right, by Blum and all, and John Hopkins was involved in 2018, showed you need a robust B cell response, antibodies, if you're gonna get rid of Lyme, and it's exactly the opposite that we found in these patients. Inflammation. It was about 70%, not surprising. We looked at SED rates, CRP, which is indirect marker of interleukin-6, one of those inflammatory molecules produced in Lyme. Again, not surprising you would find so much inflammation. But look at the amount of mercury and lead we found. We found mercury and lead in the vast majority of people and some arsenic, aluminum, and cadmium. Now, why is that important? Mercury causes the same symptoms as Lyme disease. It causes fatigue and headaches and memory problems and neuropathy and psychiatric issues exactly the same. When I did a study years ago, about a quarter of my patients that I chelated and pulled out the mercury said my Lyme symptoms were better. Take home message for all of you looking for answers. Please make sure you've checked your heavy metals, you've pulled out the toxins, mercury, lead, fatigue, encephalopathy, I can't think, neuropathy, right? What does arsenic do? Neuropathy, cardiomyopathy, cancer, right? Mercury acts as a haptin on the outside of the cells. It's been associated with hundreds of autoimmune diseases. So is it mercury and Lyme and the microbiome and all these things driving autoimmune reactions? Aluminum, they're finding it in Alzheimer's dementia, especially people on dialysis where it's been well known. And cadmium has been a marker. It's been shown to be one of the factors causing breast cancer in women, causing prostate cancer in men, it affects the kidneys, and it basically affects the telomeres of your body for early aging. We're finding that in a bunch of people. And not just small numbers, we actually ran how many had like low levels, how many had high levels. You'll notice that roughly half of these people had very high levels of these metals. Again, all of the information, by the way, is in the articles online, and it's fine if you take pictures, but it's all in the articles, you'll be able to see it. What about mold? Over 70% of our patients tested positive for mold toxins in the ones we asked, had you ever had exposure to mold or black mold? And that would mean, oh, I've had exposure, my stachybotrys titer was positive. It was aflatoxins, ochratoxins, trichothicines, and gliotoxins. Now, why am I concerned about the amount of mold? Well, mold has been associated in the literature. Joe Brewer published it years ago. It can cause chronic fatigue. But gliotoxins that you're seeing showed up in 100% of all the people with mold. What does gliotoxins do? It's immunosuppressive. So let's put this in perspective. Anaplasma, if you don't get anaplasma early, anaplasma can be immunosuppressive. Lyme, as I've just showed you, can affect the immune system and affect immunosuppression. Mercury affects autoimmunity, gliotoxins. You have to get to all the underlying sources of where this is coming from. And then we found a fair number of people, 45% with food allergies, and a lot of these people, right, had leaky gut. How do you measure leaky gut? You measure something in the blood called zonulin. Zonulin is a marker for the spaces between the intestinal cells to see if you may have leaky gut. There are labs like Dunwoody Labs in Georgia that can run these type of markers. When you heal the leaky gut and you get people off the allergic foods, 
There's a whole subset of Lyme patients that say they feel much better. Less fatigue, less headaches, less pain because you're bringing down one of those inflammatory sources of where the inflammation's coming from. Now, we only tested 1.5% right? had high histamine, but the problem is when I started to do this study, I was not checking everyone for mast cell activation. Those are markers like tryptase, histamine, chromaglandin A, prostaglandin D2. There are markers for histamine. You'll, you'll see it in my book. You have to be checked for mast cell if you're one of these people that sneezes and wheezes and has a lot of itching and frequent migraines and you just can't get better because mast cell is one of those inflammatory sources that is driving that response in Lyme patients. And why are the nutritional deficiencies important of iodine, copper, magnesium, and zinc? And here's the take home message for you and your doctors. When you check it, don't just check serum magnesium, check RBC, red blood cell magnesium, check RBC copper. Why? Because most of your minerals are intracellular. They're in the red blood cells. So if you just do a serum magnesium, you're missing 99% of your magnesium, which is inside the cells. You need iodine for proper thyroid function. You need copper for an enzyme in the body called superoxide dismutase. So I told you earlier with Lyme, we have inflammation. That's called free radical oxidative stress. You've got these free radicals attacking your body. Superoxide dismutase is one of those enzymes to handle the free radicals. If you don't have copper, you're not making superoxide dismutase, okay? What about magnesium? You need magnesium and 300 enzymes in the body for detoxification. How many people have problems, right, with either spasm or Herxheimer's where you have difficulty getting over the Herxes? You need magnesium for detox. And zinc, you need for immune system functioning. There was an NIH study years ago in the nursing homes. They looked at elderly people and they found that those who were zinc deficient had high levels of these inflammatory cytokines making them sick. Zinc actually has an effect on balancing your immune system and helping you to fight infection. Anaplasma, zinc, mold, lime, all of these things affecting your immune system. So you have to check the minerals and the food allergies because it's playing a big role. In our study, not a lot of people ended up having mitochondrial dysfunction based on the question. We gave you NT factors, CoQ10, acetyl L-carnitine, things that help the mitochondria to function. Only about 7.5% they felt, said they felt better, but why could that be? It was basically because they mostly felt better from dapsone combination therapy. We couldn't tell the difference, right? But there are a group of people, and Garth Nicholson published this, about a third of the Lyme community has been shown to have mitochondrial dysfunction. So if you're one of these people that says, I still have ongoing fatigue, I just can't figure it out, you may want to do a mitochondrial regeneration. NT factors, CoQ10, acetyl L-carnitine, NADH, right, ribose cardio. You may want to get those mitochondria regenerated. Make sure you don't have food allergies. Make sure you don't have blood sugar swings. Make sure you don't have POTS, right? Treat all the, inf it goes back to that differential diagnosis that we've been talking about. This will not be surprising to you that about 90% of the people had psych issues, mostly depression, anxiety. This is extremely dangerous because of the work that Bob Bransfield is doing, who's a brilliant Lyme literate psychiatrist who has shown that there are many suicides in the United States every year because people don't have hope. And you will remember when I opened up this talk, I said, there's one message I want to open up for you. And I'm not a person who lies and just wants to make you feel good. What I'm telling you today is working in the Lyme population. There is hope. But if you have not done the 16-point MSIDS review, if you've not used agents that disrupt biofilms, if you've not used persister drugs, you're not going to know the full effect of how well you can actually be because my wife was relapsing for 21 years. I tweaked her thyroid, she felt better. I picked up her adrenal, she felt better. I treated her hypoglycemia, she felt better. I treated her candida, she felt better. I had her deal with the PTSD from my mother-in-law. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that out loud. <laughs> I dealt with all the underlying, so I'm sorry, I hope my mother-in-law never sees this. Um, I dealt with all the underlying sources of inflammation, right? What was I missing towards the end? Persister drugs and mast cell. Once those two are done, she is in great health. So there is hope for all of you, but you've got, you must have hope with this. And for those of you that are suffering, that are saying, no, there's not answers, there are answers. That is why I'm here. 
I've turned down 18 speaking engagements so far. I've been actually counting them in the last 18 months. I agreed to come here because of the amazing work that Nat Cap Lime and what is going on here that Monty and the organization has been doing. But I'm here also to give you that message of hope. Please, I beg of you, for those of you, and I met some of you out front who are struggling, there is hope. Do not give up. You must work with your doctor with these 16 points to move this ahead because there are answers for you. Neurological. Neurological dysfunction, 94% had neuropathy and it was mostly migratory, the hallmark of Lyme. Migratory, nerve pain, tingling, numbness, burning, stabbing. That's how you know if the Lyme is still around. It's one of the hallmark symptoms of Lyme. But we found a few people that, in fact, did not have multiple sclerosis, right? Because MS looks exactly like Lyme. You get optic neuritis, you get neuropathy, you get bladder dysfunction, right? You can get myelin basic proteins and oligoclonal bands on a spinal fluid, much more in Lyme. You can get MRIs with unidentified bright objects, much more with MS, corpus callosum. I mean, there's differences, but I have to tell you, it looks pretty similar. And if you listen to Steve Phillips' old work on the Faroe Islands where there was no MS and the British invaded and all of a sudden MS existed on the island, people have questioned whether there's an infectious agent. If you look at the MSIDS review for MS, what do you find? Well, you find low vitamin D has been associated with MS, chlamydia pneumonia has been associated with MS, Epstein-Barr variants have been associated with MS, Lyme has been associated with MS, mercury causes demyelination, Bartonella. What is MS? Is it MSIDS? Do we need to start looking at every chronic disease that you name the disease and you throw a drug at it. Here's your Avanox, here's your beta serin, here's your Copaxone, here's your Rebif, here's your Rituxan. Really? Yes, those drugs work for certain people, but get to the underlying sources of why these people are ill. Don't just name a disease. That's pharmaceutical companies that have gotten into med schools that have taught people how to do medicine. You do differential diagnosis but you do it and you break it down according to the 16 point MSIDs. If we wanna help the healthcare system, which is broken, and that's the reason, by the way, I'm trying to stay at HHS and I've put in an application to work on the FDA science board. The reason I'm staying in the government is I am hoping to make a difference because our system is broken. I don't need to tell you this, but. <laughs> Endocrine. Adrenal abnormalities, 70%. Please do a DHEA cortisol saliva test if you've not done one. It makes a huge difference. I had a guy for 13 years who was sick going to multiple physicians. Nothing was working, including Lyme Babesia Barrett. He never checked his adrenals. He was in book one. I think I called him Larry. The minute I found adrenals, within seven days, he was at 85% of normal. One nail, it's the way I describe it is a Guy goes into a doctor's office with 16 nails in the foot, says, Doc, I got foot pain. And the doctor pulls out a nail. It's like, you got a lot of nails to pull out. In this case, it was actually one. There can be one factor on the MSITS map that makes all the difference. But for men, if your libido is low, and this is, by the way, women and men, because Lyme just shuts down people's libido, you got to check the testosterone levels, and you got to make sure, if you're replacing it, that you're checking estrogen. Now, what's really funny is when I lecture here in the States, people are really concerned about brain fog and fatigue and joint pain. When I lecture in Europe in France, because I, I speak French, and I speak to the French doctors, and I go, yes, you, uh, you men, you uh, will not be able to make love to your French women. Uh, <laughs> then they all freak out. They're not worried about the fatigue and the joint pain, but tell them they can't make love to their French women. They are freaking out. Oh my God, Lyme, it's a national disaster. There are precursors of your hormones, pregnenolone and DHEA. These are at the top part of your hormones that make your sex hormones, they make your adrenal hormones. Please check them because we find people with DHEA and preg DHEA. These are at the top part of your hormones that make your sex hormones, they make your adrenal hormones. Please check them because we find people with DHEA and pregnenolone abnormalities. You kind of give those precursors, all of a sudden the sex hormones work better, the adrenal hormones work better. Not surprising, 98% of people don't fall asleep with Lyme. Boy, that is a real shocker, right, for those of you in the audience. Um, but remember, you could be a thin woman weighing 100 pounds, and you can still have obstructive sleep apnea. So if you are not getting better and you're treating your Lyme because Lyme causes insomnias, hypersomnias, I sleep for 18 hours, I can't get out of bed, right, I keep waking up, you still have to do a differential diagnosis. Do you have sleep apnea? 
Do you have restless leg where it's a dopamine problem? If you're a man, right, do you have benign prostatic hypertrophy? Um, women, is it menopause where your estrogen progesterone's off? Is it high adrenals where you can't? F it always goes back to differential diagnosis. POTS, about 40%. About 20% was moderate POTS. How did we diagnose it? Get a baseline blood pressure pulse sitting, five minutes, stand up the patient. At three minutes, six minutes, nine minutes, check the blood pressure pulse. I thought I was the first person to actually invent this and figure this out. It turns out it was actually published in the literature before me. I didn't even, nobody taught this one to me in med school. Without sending people for a head up tilt table test, you can actually figure out who has POTS. If your pulse rate goes up 20 to 30 points standing in a medical office while your blood pressure is barely hanging on, that's POTS, right? And it's been published, so we're the second publication actually on this. But this is the symptoms of resistant fatigue and dizziness and brain fog and anxiety and palpitations, and it's not treated with antibiotics. It's salt, fluid, licorice, fluoronef, midodrine, Northera. It's all in the books, it's all in the articles. GI, here's an interesting one. Up to 10% of people had gluten sensitivity or celiac, and some of those people didn't even know they had celiac disease. Not one doctor had ever done a TTG, a tissue transglutaminase, to look for celiac, right? 21% had candida. Why is that one important? Well, if you take antibiotics, if you come off and you say, you know, I'm still not feeling great, clear out for candida. Go take some fluconazole or some compounded nystatin or some berberine, some caprylic acid. There's a whole bunch of natural essential oils you can do. Clear out for candida because it causes fatigue, pain, brain fog, anxiety. It looks like Lyme. And there's a subset of our patients, when we clear them out for candida, they go, oh my god, that was it. So in other words, you may have hit the co-infections of the Lyme and taking care of the POTS and the food allergies, but you may need to look at candida and mitochondrial dysfunction when they're done with the treatment. Now, not one patient in the study had C. diff diarrhea. There was an article published by the CDC a couple of years ago, one of my favorites of five to six patients who had life-threatening complications from long-term antibiotics. How many people have actually seen that nauseating article? Which is supposed to tell us all that we should not be using longer-term antibiotics for Lyme because it just doesn't work and it's so dangerous. You want to know what's dangerous? It's over a thousand people suiciding every year because you didn't come up with an answer for this chronic disease, right? The good news, though, about what I'm telling you with Dapsone, this new protocol, and I still have to publish the new protocol. It's not the one that I just published. This guy came into my office and accidentally took a double dose of Dapsone. He was sick for about eight years, in bed, couldn't work, couldn't go to school. He's on doxyrefamp and dapsone three months, comes back the fourth month. Oh, doc, I feel terrible. Well, what are you on? Oh, I took doxy twice a day, refampin twice a day, and dapsone twice a day. And I said, you took dapsone twice a day? Get off everything. You're going to hurt yourself. He comes back a month later, and he goes, doc, I feel great. I'm at 85% of normal. I only have a little neuropathy, and he needed IVIG. I said, don't take anything. Stay off the drugs. He comes back in three months. No relapse. He comes back in six months. He's sick for eight years. Comes back in a year. No relapse. My wife did that protocol. She's almost two years now in remission. Now, I cannot advise you to do this double dose yet <laughs> until I publish, but I'm, if you're noticing, I'm starting to publish the results. I'm working two days a week. Part of that is to serve the government. Part of that is to publish. Part of that is to try and serve the millions at this point. This protocol, this little tweak to the protocol, which I would have never done myself, it is making a difference. But where it's not working is the people with active Babesia Bartonella. The ones that are failing this higher dose Dapsone, and that's why I'm highlighting for you the need. Work with your doctors to go after these co-infections before you start doing, or even trying to do, a higher dose Dapsone. Because when my wife did the standard dosage at 100, she felt great. But she would slowly backslide. She's not backslid since she did the higher dose. The trick that I learned to manage the side effects is a compounded drug called methylene blue. Methylene blue reverses the worst side effect of the Dapsone, and I'll tell you about it in a second. I'm just going to finish this up and then finish up with Dapsone, and then we'll do some question and answers. The only thing you need to know about liver functions in Lyme is Lyme and every co-infection, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Q Fever, they all raise liver functions. 
So if you have someone with unexplained liver functions and you've done the differential diagnosis that a board-certified internist should do, do you have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which by the way, a, how old was she at the time? I can tell you this for HIPAA because Olivia let me know. She was, she saw 53 Colorado doctors and had liver biopsies at age nine. Not one doctor checked her for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. It's on the list of the MSIDS model. You have elevated liver functions, check for hemochromatosis, iron overload, check ceruloplasm for copper overloaded, check for hepatitis, check for alpha-1. It's not rocket science, it's a checklist, okay? But it's a checklist that covers all of these different things. What else did the Colorado doctors not find? POTS, mold, Babesia Bart, and horrible immune deficiency. Olivia is now one year out in remission since she did Dapsone. She doesn't have one symptom. Now, she has to still do IVIG and stuff for immune, but the point I'm getting to you is with hope. There is not a doubt in my mind. I came across this protocol based on John Hopkins' research, based on all the great research that Eva Shapi and Ying Zhang and Dr. Feng, right, and, and Stanford University researchers, Dr. J, all of these researchers in the bench side have allowed me to take this into the clinic and say, what can I do with this information that's gonna make a difference, okay? And the last two points, pain, 93% with migratory pain. Again, not surprising, but make sure you don't have other causes like Babesia, BART, environmental toxins, mercury driving the pain. And finally, about a third were disabled. Those people need to do physical therapy, right? Those are the only way you're gonna get these people out of wheelchairs. So, here's that slide again. Primary sources of inflammation, microbiome, different infections, co-infections, sleep, downstream effects. Now let's go forward. What is the common denominator? Multiple intracellular infections, Borrelia, right? And these also relapsing fever, Bartonella, mycoplasma, tularemia, rickettsia, they're intracellular infections. When you combine those with toxins, and the nutritional deficiencies with leaky gut and food allergies and lack of sleep, it's driving the inflammatory response, which is causing all of your Lyme symptoms, and it's also causing immune dysfunction. But the thing here about this is, is that these intracellular infections, they may be located in biofilms. And when you look and you now look at the literature and what's happening, including the study that was just published, and I'll show you this from Hopkins, we are now seeing that the biofilms are really playing one of the essential roles, and it's part of the reason I'm having the success that I'm having, is using multiple agents that disrupt biofilms, stevia from Nutramedics, oregano oil, biocidin. Those are the three biofilm busters that I'm using, right? Eva Shapi showed this years ago, was published in PLOS One. She's also seen it in Borrelia lymphocytomas. But as I told you about mycobacterium, tuberculosis, and leprosy, when Lyme was identified as a persister bacteria, I went to the literature and said, well, let me try these tuberculosis leprosy drugs. And they use for other persister bacteria. Let's see what happens with Lyme. And that's how I'm having the success that I'm having. So the study that we published about three years ago, are mycobacterium drugs effective for treatment-resistant Lyme, tick-borne co-infections, and autoimmune? Was this woman? who for 20 years was seeing about eight rheumatologists. She had Bisset syndrome. You notice on her tongue, she had these ulcers. She had these ulcers also in other parts of her body. You notice at, on her hand, she had these big lumps at the base of her fingers. Those were granulomas. They were called initially Winkleman's granulomas. It turned out they were not Winkleman's granulomas. They were Bartonella granulomas. After 19 years of doing prednisone, methotrexate, Arava Enbrel, and having osteoporosis with a T-score of minus five, because of all these drugs they gave her, which weren't helping her besets, I gave her doxyrifampin and pyrazinamide, the tuberculosis drug that shortens the course. Within three months, her beset symptoms cleared for the first time in 20 years. But what happened is, her Bartonella titus, which were negative, when I used doxyrifampin dapsone, it pissed off the bugs in the intracellular compartment, and all of a sudden, her Bartonella titers turned positive. Her tularemia titers went up fourfold to 1 to 320, and her herpes virus 6 titers went up by fourfold. I reactivated her infections by going into the intracellular compartment and then taking pyrazinamide with doxyrifampin and finding a solution. So what is besets? It's called Silk Road disease. They used to see it in China and the Silk Road. Do you know what exists on that area? 
Bartonella Quintana trench fever with parasites. My best guess of this unknown autoimmune disease that no one's been able to figure out is Bartonella combined with parasites. So when we look at the biofilms, they're responsible for many infections that fail conventional antibiotics, whether it's C. diff, candida, endocarditis. There's been a thousand-fold decreases in susceptibility to regular antibiotics with biofilms. And Dr. Shapi has published on Borrelia lymphocytoma, so in people seeing it. And this just got published several days ago from John Hopkins. Stationary phase persister biofilm microcolonies for Borrelia causes more severe disease in the mouse model of Lyme arthritis. There it was, the biofilm persister forms driving the inflammatory response. That's exactly what we're seeing in our clinical practice. So what I did from the work of Hopkins from Zong is I took oregano oil, I took the work of stevia from uh, the University of New Haven, I took biocidin, I combined them, and I did the first Dapsone study, which was published about two and a half years ago. 100 patients on Dapsone combination therapy, doxyrifampin Dapsone, statistical significance for fatigue, pain, um, memory concentration problems, sleep, sweats, babesia. The only one that was not affected in that study was headaches, but in the second study, which was now 200 people, there was statistical significance of P less than 0.001 for all eight major Lyme symptoms. And these were people, by the way, who failed all prior regimens, who kept relapsing over and over. So when you look at the graph, you can notice the fatigue got better, muscle pain got better, headaches got better. All of the major Lyme symptoms got better with doxy, rifampin, and dapsone, three intracellular drugs, three biofilm busters, Plaquenil to alkalize the intracellular compartment, also with grapefruit seed extract, by the way, which has been published by uh, Dr. Borson, also for the cystic round body forms. So he's plaquenil grapefruit seed, right? And we use, of course, nystatin to keep down yeast. So there's a new biofilm study we're going to publish, but this was done, this was shown at the ILADS International Conference two years ago. If you look at the slides, this is Borrelia biofilms treated with like doxy alone, Rifampin alone, which by the way, rifampin has an effect on biofilms. Who knew? Guess that's maybe why it works for leprosy and certainly these TB drugs. Take a look at the bottom slide on dapsone doxy rifampin. You'll notice you can barely see cyber green means it's alive. You barely see anything alive in that one. That's because within 72 hours in culture, using this combination, it was the most effective combination for getting rid of Borrelia biofilms in these persister forms within 72 hours. We're about to publish another study. We're working on the paper now. We have multiple combinations that were done. It's going to show exactly the same results. It is the most effective combination in culture at this point. The other advantage for those of you with brain fog is John Hopkins and John Alcott had published a study just last year on cognitive decline. 92% of the patients said they had memory concentration problems. But when he did, a real analysis, he found only about 26% could really be found to have significant cognitive decline. Well, what did we find? So in 165 patients with Lyme MSIDS, 91% had cognition problems, almost the same as the Hopkins study. But you'll notice the group that we had with either moderate, moderate, severe, or severe cognitive impairment was three times higher at 78%. And despite the fact that they had multiple overlapping etiologies driving the cytokines, heavy metals, mold toxins, right, uh, all of the issues I told you about, dapsone combination therapy still improved the brain fog and the cognitive symptoms statistically with p-values less than 0.001. Why does dapsone work so well? It has great central nervous system penetration. I've only had to use two IV lines in the last year. I no longer have to do IV drugs since I have discovered this protocol. Two, I used to have loads of people having to do IV recephin. I don't have to put lines in as much with this protocol. Great CNS penetration. What else does it do? It has antibacterial effects by stopping RNA and protein production. It works against the broad range of pathogens. And it affects the different forms of Borrelia, so the round body forms, right? These cystic forms, L forms, S forms, cell wall deficient forms as well as the biofilm and stationary forms, the ones that Dr. Ying Zhang and Dr. Feng just published on, dapsone combination therapy is affecting it, and it has an anti-inflammatory effect. So in your white cells, you have an enzyme called myeloperoxidase. It drives inflammation. 
Dapsone lowers it down, helps with autoimmunity, hits the bugs, stops protein production, hits the babesia, hits the malaria, gets into the central nervous system. It almost sounds too good to be true. I've been waiting for a combo like this for 32 years looking for a cure for this disease. And although I'm not sure and I would never tell anyone I found a cure, I can tell you this is the closest I have ever found to a durable remission where certain patients one by one in my practice are no longer having to come back to me on a regular basis. It is really amazing, and it's very hopeful for those of you in the line. So last couple of things, so we'll have some time for question and answers. The one thing you need to know about Dapsone, as I call it, do no harm. H's is herxes, A is anemia, R is rashes, M is methemoglobinemia. Dapsone will cause some of the worst Herxheimer reactions you've ever seen. I use low-dose naltrexone at 4.5 milligrams to lower down microglial activation of the brain. It, do, it will lower down a lot of those inflammatory cytokines. You have to use up to 2,000 milligrams of liposomal glutathione. Glutathione will not only remove toxins, but it reverses methemoglobin, which is one of the oxidized hemoglobin byproducts you get from using Dapsone. You can alkalize the body. If you give vitamin C, if you give Alka-Seltzer gold, sodium bicarbonate, it shifts the acid byproducts to an alkaline state. People feel better. You can give herbs and things to drainage remedies, and you can use things like red root bone set Smilax or Saparilla, which are herbs that have been scientifically proven to help with herxes. They're all in the back of my book. You can find where to order these things and how to use them. Anemia, you need to use at least 65 milligrams of folic acid 50 milligrams of leucovorin, 15 milligrams of L-methylfolate. In the studies, I actually use Zymogen's uh, Folify, ER. You may need more. Z this drug will cause you to drop your hemoglobin by three grams, even up to four grams, but it stops there. When my wife did double-dose Dapsone, her hemoglobin was 8.9. And we were walking up hills together, walking outside. But when you have slow decreases in anemia, it's not like you have a GI bleed and you pass out. You get used to it. She's now at 14 and a half. When you come off the drug, it rebounds, but you gotta give folic acid. The drug is a folic acid inhibitor, right? So high doses of folic acid. Women, no iron deficiency anemia before you try doing this. You wanna get your hemoglobin all the way up. And you cannot use ozone or oxidative stress. If you use ozone or any oxidative therapies with this therapy, you will drive methemoglobin levels, which is oxidized hemoglobin. You're going to get blue hands, blue lips, and shorter breath, and you're going to feel terrible. Now, when you stop the drug, it reverses quickly. None of these things will last. For people, for example, that say, oh, I have a high menstrual period, I'm bleeding, you can give 150 or 200 milligrams of folic acid and reverse the anemia within days without ever doing a blood transfusion. I've done it. So you have to know you have to really push the folic acid, but you've got to tell your doctor if you're having heavy menstrual cycles or anything else that could lead to another form of anemia. And fortunately, it's a, it's a sulfur drug, but people who can't tolerate Bactrim can tolerate Dapsum. But we will give them an H1, H2 blocker like Zyrtec Zantac to block histamine doing it. So we use BLT, Greenwood Herbals, uh, Herx formulas, Pecana drainage, LDN, high-dose glutathione. We use NAC, which helps your body to make glutathione. Alpha-lipoic acid helps your body to regenerate glutathione and helps with free radicals. It's both water-soluble and fat-soluble. We control inflammation, Mediterranean-style diets, right? Paleo-Mediterranean, lots of omega-3s, getting off your allergic foods, getting off gluten and dairy and wheat and all the things you could be allergic to makes a huge difference heal the leaky gut, make sure you don't have mast cell. And then we sometimes use epigenetic modifiers. What are epigenetic modifiers? Green tea, broccoli seed extract, sulforaphane glucosinolate, curcumin, resveratrol. Those are the four main epigenetic modifiers. What does that tell your DNA? It says stay in the straight and narrow and don't do any crazy stuff. But what it also does, there's a switch inside your nucleus called NF-kappa B. When you get free radical oxidative stress, you got this little molecule in your cytoplasm called KEEP2. Oxidative stress has KEEP dissociate, goes into your nucleus, turns on this NF-kappa B, and you make cytokines like crazy. What these broccoli seed extracts and curcumin and resveratrol do is they block NF-kappa B. They shut down the inflammatory response. And the nice part about 
uh, the broccoli seed extract, which by the way was <laughs> discovered at Hopkins. They've used it at 300 milligrams for the autistic population and the autistic kids at high dose actually got better when they did the initial study. I take 200 milligrams because it's an epigenetic modifier, opens up the detox pathways, anti-inflammatory, and hits the P53 gene. So if you're prone to cancer, my whole family died of cancer. My mother, my family, and six aunts and uncles, I have no one left. And I don't know if they were Ashkenazi Jews and it was genetics or they lived in Brooklyn and they were smokers. I have no idea. <laughs> I am taking every one of these epigenetic modifiers. In fact, when I die, you should all biopsy to find out all these supplements I took to find out actually what they did to me because who knows really. But the point is, is we're having good results using these epigenetic modifiers for those people who need it. But methemoglobin levels is the worst side effect of this apart from anemia. Glutathione high dose, tagamet cimetidine, believe it or not, has been published in literature. I don't think it's very strong. The real key is oral methylene blue through a compounding pharmacy. The people who had to take high dose dapsone, I gave this protocol, which I told you not to do yet. I gave it to 110 people. 75 out of the 110 are no longer taking drugs. The 35 that failed, Babesia Bart. How did I get them to tolerate high dose dapsone? They were all on methylene blue. They normally do methylene blue in an emergency room IV. I found a way to do it oral. That's how I get people to tolerate the drug. So I've been playing with folic acid doses, playing with the doses, right, of all of these supplements. And I've actually figured out how to get people to get through this. But no joke, this thing's like cancer chemotherapy. When you're on this thing for several months, do not expect to feel well. The only time you're going to know how you feel is when you're off of this regimen. OK, so be clear if you do work with your doctors about this. And I am doing two training courses for physicians. One sold out June 7th to 9th. There may be another one, a few openings, August 7th to 9th. If you have a doctor who wants to learn these protocols, we're doing it at the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center. Uh, it's the second one I'm doing August 7th to 9th. So let's finish up. How do we shift the paradigm? This is not just Lyme. This is multiple co-infections. This is environmental toxins. This is autoimmune manifestations with epigenetic changes. This is immune deficiency with immune dysfunction. Right? The inflammation is coming from multiple sources. It's causing downstream effects on your hormones and your adrenals, right? And, and you're not falling asleep and the microbiome is being thrown off. Go through the 16-point episodes in detail, but find all the sources of inflammation by treating all the infections, especially Babesia Bart, and treating your Lyme with log phase drugs, penicillin cephalosporins, cyst round body drugs, Plaquenil, sometimes Flagyl, which I had discovered years ago, but Herx's people like crazy with Candida. You can use Plaquenil, you can use grapefruit seed. It's the intracellular pathogens and the biofilm persisters. That's really where this is going for those of you who have failed therapy, and that's doxyrifamp and dapsone, right? That's using stevia, biocidin, right, oregano oil. That's the combo that seems to be working as long as you've gotten to all the sources of inflammation, opening up the detox pathways and repairing the mitochondria, rebalancing the autonomic nervous system if you have POTS, re-inoculating the GI tract, right, and replacing the hormones. You've got to get those four R's in place because any of those that are missing, you're not going to get the maximum effect that you could get. So finishing up, how do we improve patients' health? You treat the primary sources of inflammation you treat the downstream effects. And again, there is hope because once you get to all of these different sources, it is helping about 95% of my most resistant patients. So this has been the prior and present state of medicine. I'm sorry I can't heal you. You have a pre-existing. I can't believe, by the way, I can't believe politically this is actually coming up again about whether we're going to take away pre-existing conditions. That's an interesting one. Here's the future of medicine. Shift the paradigm to a personalized precision medicine model. Laura, you have a rare condition called perfect health. Frankly, I'm not sure how to treat it. Can't we all wait for the day that that is actually going to happen? And from my perspective, it's personalized medicine. There's not one person in this room that will have exactly the same load of co-infections and toxins. And that's why you need a personalized precision medicine approach. So when we treat the Lyme and the co-infections, and we deal with the immune dysfunction, and we go through all of these factors on the MSIDS map, and we deal with the inflammation, and we lower it down, 
We found that by treating all the sources of inflammation, but again, it's not just treating with rocephin and ceftin and active log phase drugs. You've got to get in with the round body forms, the persister forms, the biofilms. That is crucial for this talk today. For those of you who have not done those protocols, treat the co-infections, detoxify, right, repair the mitochondria. It makes a huge difference. And I just want to thank my staff who helped with all the data collection to thank um, the Bay Area Lyme, they have been incredibly supportive, great organization, uh, just like NatCap, um, and the MSIDS Research Foundation. So thank you all for your time and attention here today. Now, th there was actually a video. You want to sing a little bit before I finish here? Uh, let me just do the song just okay. because otherwise we'll never have time. All right, so many of you may know this story. Um, I was in my office one day and Daryl Hall came in and I said, hey, Daryl, I've got something to show you. So I pull out my guitar and I start singing a song and he cracks up so hard he goes, let's come into the studio and record this. And I thought, oh, you mean I'll record it. I didn't think you were going to record it with me. So um, for those of you who don't know this song, it's called Ballad of the Deer Tick. Um, I wrote this song probably about 10 years ago. I was in a cafe in Massachusetts, kind of getting an espresso. This thing just downloaded. Um, I'm singing on this. This is me. These are my words and music. I'm the lead. It's probably the only time in Daryl Hall's life that he's backing up someone like me. Um, so uh, this is called Battle of the Deer Tick. Many of you who like, please feel free to um, just hit. Clyde came to my office one bright sunny day Said, Doc, I'm in an awful bad way To 19 docs and I'm almost dead All they can tell me is it's in my head Doctor, please help me, please I said, Clyde, can you tell me what you did in life That caused you all this terrible strife Said, Doc, I was with my beautiful wife The woods one day enjoying life Lay down on the ground and we fooled around Before you knew it, I was illness bound From that day on, what I've been going downhill Can you give me a lotion or a potion or a magic pill? Doctor, please help me, please Gonna pick off a tick real quick Before the devil gets within Grab for the line to steal my mind I sure could use it for a little more time it hurts over here, it hurts over there, it hurts in places everywhere. It hurts in my fingers and it hurts in my toes. It hurts in places where nobody goes. I said, Clyde, this is your lucky day. I know why you're feeling in such a bad way. The night in the shower, did you check to see if there's anything attached to the back of your knee? Or anywhere else, or anywhere else. I think you know what I mean Did you notice a mite or a bite Or a tick or a ring Or any such unusual thing To shake or quake, get hot or cold Before your illness really took hold I looked at me with a tear in his eye And let out one enormous sigh I Said, Doc, I remember some unusual rash On my nose and my toes And when nobody goes I'm gonna pick off the tick real quick the devil gets within Crime for the line to steal my mind Sure could use it for a little more time It hurts over here, it hurts over there It hurts in places everywhere it hurts in my fingers and it hurts in my toes it hurts in places where nobody goes I said, Clyde, this is not chronic fatigue Fibromyalgia, systemic lupus, trigeminal neuralgia, halitosis, multiple sclerosis, or any hocus pocus diagnosis. It's about time you got tested for Lyme. It'll be wiser to check your Eliza. It'll be easier to treat your Babesia once we show. Just pray it's positive. You'll be lucky indeed. Gonna 
pick off the tick real quick before the devil gets within. Crime for a lion to steal my mind, sure could use it for a little more time. It hurts over here, it hurts over there, it hurts in places everywhere. It hurts in my fingers and it hurts in my toes, it hurts in places where nobody goes. Nobody knows, nobody knows, nobody knows, nobody knows. First time in a long time I'm speechless. Uh, <laughs> I had not seen that film before. It's great. It really is. Now, we have a time problem here. It's five, I'm looking back there. It's five after four. Dr. Horowitz has to leave here. There's a car picking him up at quarter of five. So we have 45 minutes. And I want to spend those 45 minutes wisely. Let's say we do uh, 20 minutes for Q&A or 25 minutes for Q&A, and then we have a presentation for Dr. Horowitz. So what we'd like to do today, we've set it up. By the way, I want to tell you, don't worry. We're having this videograph. We have a new videographer back there. Bob, you want to hold up your hand? They can't miss you. And yes, he's going to make that available to you, slides and everything. When do you think it'll be ready, Bob? Three to four weeks, that long? Okay, well, we'll try to get it as soon as possible, but it'll be up on the website under the esteemed speakers, so don't worry, and you've got the book. There are a few books left outside, but um, I think there's 13 if you want to pick them up. Barbara, or the, one of the girls, is out there. Um, so let's, people that have questions, we'd like you to line up at the mic, and I want to say one question per person, be mindful of the time element, but right at 425, I'm going to cut it off, OK? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, the bacteria, the uh, good microbes in the gut and the heavy antibiotic. Uh, load and how much should we worry about that and how can it be fixed or ameliorated? So the thing about it is that it's, it's an excellent question. We definitely need to be concerned about the microbiome. What I do in these protocols is, um, and I believe I actually put the names of the companies we use in the book, but we use Ultraflora DF, we use Theralac, which has an FDA patent. Um, they are basically coated. They have a sodium alginate coat so that 95% of their 40 to 60 billion bacteria get into the small intestine. And the five strains that they use in this are actually been shown in octogenarians who live the longest on the planet. That's one of the probiotics I take myself every day. So I use Ultraflora, I use Theralac, I use Saccharomyces boulardii. Saccharomyces boulardii is a healthy yeast. It's been shown to help decrease C. diff diarrhea. So we use about 200 to 300 billion of these good bacteria you have to keep down the sugar in your diet, really keep it down, because otherwise you're going to get a yeast candida overgrowth right in the gut. But the thing about these new protocols is nobody wants anyone to be on long-term antibiotics. Um, I'm in the middle of looking at trying to do a prospective study, and hopefully John Hopkins will be one of the centers that will be doing this. This new Dapsone protocol that I'm trying to develop, we're talking about two to three months. We're not talking about years of antibiotics. So when you're done with the antibiotics, but I, I should point out, and doctors who give antibiotics for like sinus infections or an up, they don't even give probiotics most of the time. And it's been shown that you can destroy the microbiome of the gut for one year, just giving seven days of an antibiotic. So realize, yes, it's a problem with Lyme, but it's also a problem with all the other infections that the pediatricians are treating and everyone's treating, and they're not doing anything to replace the microbiome, and just so you understand the figures, 100,000 people in nursing homes get C. diff every year. Half a million people in the United States get C. diff every year. That would be preventable if we would just use proper probiotics, um, or at least mostly preventable. So yes, it's something to be concerned about, but if I watch the health of my patients after they're done, they stay on these high-dose probiotics, right, for a long period of time. 
we've not seen problems. It's not like I've seen more other degenerative diseases or anything else happen, but you definitely need to replace the microbiome on a regular basis, and I'm looking to do much shorter protocols for the future, so we will limit the effects on the microbiome. Thank you. Uh, a question on your new study showing the 100 people and 25% of them didn't respond well because they were infected with Bartonella and, and uh, Babesia. The question would be is, was their load just too high for this combination? Or is this treatment really for just Lyme B and all the other Lyme B species? So, so this protocol has an effect on Babesia. Dapsone is published in both studies we did that it does help with Babesia. It decreases the day sweats, night sweats, chills. But it's not going to eliminate it. So the problem is, in a lot of these patients, they had failed Mepron and Zithromax. They had failed Malarone and Zithromax. They had failed Malarone, Zithromax, um, and Bactrim. They had failed Pulse Coarctum. I'm now in the process of developing a new Babesia protocol based on some work that I got from patients who told me they've tried certain rotations. I'm now looking at that. There is a new Babesia drug that was released, but it's pretty much a copy of Larium Mefloquine that came out years ago. And the problem with the drug is it has possible QT interactions on the electrocardiogram. So these patients had been treated, but let's say they did the Dapsone protocol, the double dose, the one you're talking about, but they still had some night sweats going into the protocol. Um, or they had tested positive for Bartonella in the past, it was very clear to me that when I started looking at who succeeded and no longer needed to be on treatment, it was the ones who said, like a month later, off everything, Doc, my sweats are coming back. Or Doc, the pain in the bottom of my feet, one of the classic Bartonella symptoms was coming back, right? Or their VEGF in the blood was coming back positive. Bartonella is an extremely fastidious organism and very difficult to get rid of. I have had some success. I had a woman in the Midwest. It required five drugs, minnow, zithro, rifampin, pyrazinamide, the drug I showed you for besets, for BART, and gentamicin. And it was the first time in 12 years that this woman said to me, I am no longer relapsing within five days coming off of the antibiotics. She is now one and a half years in remission. And she had done the Dapsone protocol, but it was hitting the BART that finally got her off all the drugs. Now, the problem is gentamicin is a very effective drug in some senses, but it also can be ototoxic and nephrotoxic. It's problems with the kidneys and hearing. It's the only bactericidal, meaning killing drug, that is out there that is known in the literature for BART. The Cohen Foundation is presently sponsoring some new studies. Steve Phillips is working on it for new drugs for it, new combos. I've had some success with those type of combos, but the research that I'm now doing in my office is now working on those resistant Babesia BART, trying to come up with new protocols, because I feel like if I can get this last piece of it, I'm not saying we're home free, but we're pretty much across the finish line for most patients who say, I just can't get well. Those are the two co-infections that are proving to be the most difficult and resistant, but even with those, I'm having some success using pulse coarctum. It's all stuff that I need to publish and I need to do some, some more studies, but it's, it's coming. But yeah, it's, it's the co-infections. And that's where I told the government and HHS and the rest, we need to put our money and our research dollars into the co-infections. We already have a lot of answers, believe it or not, for Lyme. This Lyme MSIDS model is working for the vast majority. It's the co-infections. So I, I hope someone was listening when we were giving you know, this talk to HHS, because that's really where I think our, a lot of our time and our effort needs to be. What co-infection could cause vasculitis? So vasculitis can be caused by Lyme. I'm not saying we see it often, it can happen. You can also get it with BART. I mean, the thing about Bartonella, Bartonella loves blood vessels. So when we talk about VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, it's because Bartonella could get into your blood vessels and cause proliferation and cause inflammation. So um, most of the vasculitis that we've seen, and we haven't seen a lot, a lot, although I have patients with it, it's generally been Lyme and Bartonella that we've seen with most of the cases of vasculitis. Um, so usually the vasculitis will improve with rotating the proper treatments, but I have seen people where also part of the vascular tree has been destroyed and they need stem cell therapies and other things, um, hyperbaric oxygen and other things to try and help them with this. But um, fortunately for me, it's not something I see that often, but it can be, it can be challenging, but usually it's, it, from my experience, it's been Lyme and Bartonella. 
Hey, do you have, by any chance, have any comments, good or bad, regarding Rife machines, cold laser, and colloidal silver? So regarding some of the alternative therapies of cold laser, I mean, I hear anecdotal results from patients who tell me that um, they've gotten some help with cold lasers. Um, I know chiropractors that sometimes use it for joint pain, and in some people they've gotten help. The, the thing about silver is, um, what silver's mechanism is, is that it punches a hole in the cell membrane. So you get osmotic water that kind of rushes into the cell and bursts it. Um, I've tried it, I've tried colloidal, I've tried nano. I'm, I just don't think it's enough. Now, do I think that you might be able to get away with a teaspoon of nanosilver, something at a very low dose, which might augment the effects of antibiotics? And, and by the way, just so I'm clear about this, if you want to know what my fastest cure for this disease, I'm going to lay it out for you. Some of you may have said this before. It's doing what I just told you here today and doing it with heat therapy. I am absolutely convinced that raising the body temperature, the doctors in Europe will do it. I started talking about this 20 years ago. If you've got spirochetes that are hiding in different parts of your body, you can denature the spirochetes by raising the body temperature above 104 degrees for two hours. They do it at the German clinics. It started with cancer, but it's helped some people with Lyme. However, what they're not doing in the German clinics, they are not giving agents against biofilm. And what happens when you raise temperature is you create biofilms. So if you asked me, doc, what do you think is the fastest cure for this disease? I'm talking like quick, not even three months of your fastest apsone. <laughs> Heat therapy. Create a center, create an integrative center, get hyperthermia, hit the cell wall forms, the log phase, the round body forms, plaquenil grapefruit seed, maybe a dose of flagell or tinidazole, multiple intracellular, doxyrifampin dapsone, multiple biofilm busters, raise the body temperature, and then see what happens. Because then you have a much better chance by opening up the biofilms, in my opinion. Now, we need to prove this theory, but I've seen people come back from the German clinics and get better, and I've seen those who don't get better. Um, and it's pretty harrowing getting your temperature up. I don't know that they need to do it. To the, but since you asked about alternative therapies, from my perspective, the one that looks like it needs to be examined the best is just like with syphilis, they found that you raise the body temperature 104 for two hours. By the way, JAMA, if you look at the JAMA 1930s, they were using heat lamps to treat syphilis by raising body temperature. They did malaria therapy. Go back like 80, 90 years ago in the medical literature. It's really interesting to read the publications. I think for Lyme patients, this may be a quicker, more durable. So, you know, I've looked at acupuncture in Chinese medicine, I think works very well with what I do. I've seen homeopathy work for certain groups of patients, not the sickest ones I see. I've looked at pretty much every integrative therapy that there is, and it does work for certain percentages of people. I use herbs. I use the Cowden Protocol, Cementobanderol. I use traditional Chinese herbs with Coptis, um, Hutinia, R5081. Um, I use Beyond Balance herbs. I use Byron White. I've tried all of these. They help, but people relapse. I'm looking for the durable solution for you guys. I'm looking for the once and for all that you're done with this, right? And I think the alternatives will help. But I'm really interested if we could get a center here in the United States for hyperthermia and then using some of the therapies I told you about today. That, for me, might be actually a much quicker solution. Um, and unfortunately, I've spoken to the doctors in Germany, and they're just not open at this point to using the biofilm agents. But, but, but I think all of these have a role. I just don't think silver is enough. I think a small dose for a while might be helpful, but we need controlled studies. Like anything, you're going to see me publishing a lot more because I'm working two days a week, not four days. Um, and I have time now to publish studies, but we need hard published studies, just like with Hopkins when they're starting to open up their integrative center. Um, she was asking me, what do you think we should do to move forward is publish. I had a yoga therapist from India in our center years ago, Susan Abraham. She helped lots of patients with a whole broad range of internal medicine problems that no Western doctor could help. There is a role for all of these therapies, but like anything, we need to be publishing and we need to get good hard science. That's how we're going to convince everybody as far as what these therapies, because otherwise there's dangers of using things like, I used too much hydrogen peroxide, I yeah. used too much ozone, I blew out my veins, I got people using you know, MMI solutions with uh, bleach. I mean, look, I understand there's desperate people out there, but you got to be careful as far as what you're doing, and we still need hard science. If the NIH were to open up the Office of Alternative Medicine and look at all of these and do it scientifically, and I've publicly said this, I think we'd go a long way to seeing which integrative therapies would be the most beneficial.
Thank you. Hi, my question is um, your thoughts on pregnancy for women who are asymptomatic in remission who continue to work with their Lyme doctor with low-dose antibiotics and a Lyme literate GYN. So usually what I tell women in my practice who want to get pregnant, first of all, if it's a boy, they have to name him Richard. Um, <laughs> This is true, actually. I'm, not, I'm actually making a joke here. This is, a, this is an ongoing joke. I have multiple ongoing jokes in my practice. If you knew me, you'd know. This one's been going for a long time. So now what happens is the women come in with their healthy babies, and they go, his name's Aaron Richard. It's like, oh, yes! So um, the answer is, is you can get pregnant. And we've had over 100 women completely healthy pregnancies. I always put them on a cephalosporin, OK? I first learned about Lyme in pregnancy, and I posted this, I think, just yesterday, uh, because the Scientific American article, my Barry Beth Pfeiffer, came out on pregnancy. I learned about this probably 20 years ago, and I presented this at the international conference. This woman I treated for two years was completely well. Doc, I want to get pregnant. You have any symptoms? No. You sure? Well, a couple of weeks ago, I had this flash migratory pain. I'm literally a flash. I said, that's it? She said, I have nothing. I'm fine. I said, go get pregnant. This is one of these women's like rub the doll and she's pregnant. You know, she would get pregnant a drop of a hat, right? She gets pregnant, she comes in, everything's looking good, ultrasound's looking okay. At the 16 weeks, she loses the baby. We do a DNA analysis, PCR on the fetus. It's positive for Rayleigh or Burgdorferi. She has no symptoms. She gets pregnant again. Same thing happens. She miscarries, PCR positive. I put her on all drugs. She miscarries. I had to put her on IV Recephin. Now, she's the only one I ever actually had to do IV Recephin in pregnancy. Ever since then, and this is going back in my career, every woman now goes on Ceftin, Cefuroxymaxotil, 500 milligrams twice a day, completely safe in pregnancy. Just got to replace the microbiome, right? Zithromax can be used in pregnancy, but it doesn't cross the placenta. So the problem is it might be OK for you if you have an intracellular infection, but it doesn't do anything for the baby. That being said, in the 100 women, when we checked their cord blood and the placenta, there was about two of them that the Lyme PCR positive was in the cord blood, but the babies were healthy. I had one woman, and I have to publish this study. Maybe this year I'll get to it. She was on her third and fourth pregnancies. Her Babesia relapsed her third trimester. I had to give her clindamycin, mepron, and zithromax, because the babies can die from hemolytic anemia. Baby was born completely healthy. Her fourth pregnancy, the same thing happens in the third trimester. I give her clindamep, baby's healthy. i got to publish this. So I've seen relapsing Babesia. I've seen Lyme. I had one patient recently who gave birth to twins, mycoplasma PCR positive, right? But again, the babies were healthy. So the good news for the children is every woman is given birth to a healthy baby. If they're on ceftin, at least, as a cephalosporin, it could be omniceph. Some choose to do bicillin shots throughout the whole pregnancy so that they have 24-hour coverage. Um, you got to really be motivated right, to do that, but some are. Um, so I'd say yes, but just take the precautions. But remember, the longer you go without symptoms, the better this gets. Now, you know, what I would normally do is still do a PCR analysis, look at your Western blot, make sure there are no new bands on a Western blot compared to years before. But the longer you go out, if, if you're a woman and you have a menstrual cycle, and you have no increase in symptoms. The way women know what their load of their bugs are, if you're well during the month, and the only time you feel sick is right before, during, or after your menstrual cycle, women, anybody here who's had that experience, you're well, but it's only around your menses. Yeah, there's a handful. That means you have knocked the load of the bugs all the way down. It's, so what do I do for those women? I pulse the antibiotics just around their menses. I give them like a cell wall cystic intracellular biofilm every other day for a few days, not even regular antibiotics, so that every time the bugs dare to rear their heads, I go, I'm smacking you now, and boom. <laughs> and then over time, they kind of learn not to come out, right? So you're in great shape. If you've gone for a long period, just remember if it's a boy, you know, what's a name? Richard's my dad's name, so he would never... Oh, your dad's name? Oh, great. We're... <laughs> It's not, it's not going to be an issue then. Yeah, we have four generations. And just make sure he goes to med school too, right? So we keep the lineage going. Thank you. My pleasure. Hi. Um, thank you so much, first of all. I have a question with the prosinamide. can't pronounce it. The prosinamide. Pure yes. Prisinamide. Okay. Um, it's an important question. When your patients are taking it, have any of them had 
hard time breathing. How do you, how can you tell, are you having a true um, Herxheimer reaction or are you having an allergic reaction? How, as a doctor, can you differentiate between the two? And how do we know also some of the, the fillers that might be in the um, different brands, um, are you having a reaction to that? How, how do we distinguish? So there are people who um, are chemically sensitive and need compounded medications that don't have any fillers. That's a very good point, by the way, for people who have multiple chemical sensitivity who are out there. Um, some need to have pure compounded drugs. That's true. The thing about pyrazinamide, the most common side effect of pyrazinamide that you have to watch for is elevated liver functions, right? So what I do with pyrazinamide, first of all, is I use milk thistle. There's a product by Zymogen I use called Liver Protect. I use Chinese herbs by Dr. Zhang called HEPA number two. This is all in my book, by the way. I use NAC, which drives glutathione. I use alpha lipoic acid, which protects the liver, drives glutathione. We hardly ever see liver function abnormalities with pyrazinamide. If you have shortness of breath, first of all, the first question is, are there any underlying reasons for histamine? Like I have asthma, I'm histamine sensitive, I ate the wrong food because that's when my asthma kicks up is I'm off my diet. Or do you have Babesia, right? Because Babesia can cause air hunger and therefore can give you shortness of breath. Now, a true allergic reaction, you should normally be having a rash. You should be having itching, right. sense of throat closing. Um, I haven't seen anyone have that kind of an allergic reaction, but then I have a couple of people who had a rash on pyrazinamide. Yeah, and I had to stop the drug, but no one's had a breathing problem. Well, I'm just saying after taking, I, I took it. Yeah. After taking it, Within 30 minutes, I started having trouble breathing, coughing, mm -hmm. but it lasted a couple days. Um, the doctor does not think it's an allergic reaction. I waited a few days, took it again, same thing happened. Yeah, so it's, don't know it's not something I've ever heard, but the thing is, is you'd have to rule out other sources of bronchospasm. Um, did you have other symptoms of like itching, throat closing, nothing else? Coughing, like coughing and having a hard time breathing. Yeah. Look, it's possible it was an allergic reaction. It's not one I've personally seen. Um, I've given the drug to probably a couple of hundred people. And not many complaints of that? Well, I haven't actually had any, but not of this particular yeah. symptom, no. But what I would say with it is, is it possible any drug can cause any possible side effect? In other words, I wouldn't give that drug to you again, but let's say you absolutely had to use it, which I would not advise, but you use H1, H2 blockers, you block histamine. You, you do an underlying pulmonary evaluation to make sure you don't have asthma or underlying bronchoconstriction. You've never had a history of asthma. A little bit of asthma. Okay, so what may be happening is you may be getting a histamine release. If you said, I never had a history of asthma, I'd say it's pretty unusual, but you might have been getting a histamine release. And it could have not been from the drug itself, but the stuff that was, what you said, the stuff, the fillers and stuff that's in it. Have you had problems with fillers and other medications? No, this is the only medication that I've okay. had. Okay. You'd have to kind of backtrack it, but that would be the way to just go about it, is um, make sure that it's, it's a pure. But again, you try and avoid something like that for you. The reason I like pyrazinamide is it seems to be a good addition for Bartonella. Right. That's kind of where right. I've been using right. it. At the, but it's not like the only thing that can be used. One more? One more. We'll do one more. I'm sorry, y'all, but the car is still here. We got to get Dr. Horowitz to the airport to catch his flight. So just one more question. Uh, my question is that uh, my daughter suffers from encephalitis, and uh, this is the first time that I heard about the uh, Boston encephalitis. I need to know how can we get her test, and if uh, Ceftin and HBOT uh, helps with this because this is the treatment that she's getting right now and I'm desperate for uh, right. an answer. Right, so the first, the first thing about encephalitis is to check for Powassan. There are labs. Um, what state do you live in? Uh, in Virginia. In Virginia. So normally it's probably a state health department lab that does it, but Cope Labs, C-O-P-P-E, Copy Labs or Cope Labs, I don't know how you pronounce it, they will do a full panel and they will check for Powassan. They're one of the ones who published on it. So you can either do it through the state health department or you could do it um, basically through Copi Laboratories, but you'd probably want to do other flavor viruses like West Nile, because West Nile can cause an encephalitis, uh, dengue fever, there's kind of overlap sometimes with these. 
You'd want to check with that just to be sure there's no others. But when you say encephalitis, the thing is, is that encephalitis on an EEG, an electroencephalogram, like I'm having seizure activity, or you mean encephalopathy, meaning she's completely fogged out, she has no memory, she can't think, because they're two separate things. Um, she has really bad uh, brain frog, and uh, when um, she, she can't think, right. she, um, we took her to John Hopkins, and um, they thought that she had schizophrenia, but uh, Lyme's disease uh, mimics the schizophrenia, so we have done expect brains, and it's not mental illness like it's schizophrenia, mm -hmm. so um, I need to know if her Lyme disease doctor can order that the test. The, uh... Absolutely, the Lyme doctor can order Powassan, but if you're, what you're really discussing is encephalopathy, right? So if you, if you look in the book, how can I get better? Why, look under brain fog cognition and you're gonna see differential diagnoses, right? What needs to be done is Sefton is only hitting the log form, the actively replicating bacteria. What you heard today from Dapsone, if I was her parent, and she didn't have like a horrible sulfur allergy and can do this, she is definitely a candidate. First of all, your doctor needs to go through the 16-point MCIDs. Does she have Babesia? Does she have Bartonella, which can cause encephalopathy? I find that in a certain percentage, I give them IV glutathione, which detoxifies the body. About a third of the patients say my brain fog clears, just using detoxification with glut. A third say it's the best thing I've ever taken. A third say, wow, I feel better. And a third say, I feel a little better. 30% say I feel no difference. So when you're talking about brain fog, you have to differentiate it. Is it lead? Is it mercury? Is it mold toxins? Is it neurotoxins that glutathione would help, like quinolinic acid? Is it active Lyme in the brain, Bartonella in the brain, viruses? You go through every piece of the MSIDs, right? You, will find, you should find the answers. But I doubt it's Powassan encephalitis, because if it was, she probably wouldn't be here and standing. It's very, very severe forms with like strokes and vision. I mean, it's a very severe disease. Not to say it couldn't happen, but it's way more likely that she probably has Lyme and co-infections and needs drugs like the one I was describing today to get into the central nervous system with detoxification. If she's never done a trial of glutathione for the brain fog. She, she does uh, glutathione, but okay. I'll be drinking. Does, so it, does HBOT help with it? HBOT may help a little bit, but it may not be enough for someone who's so severely affected um, is really the problem. But I would tell you, with the diagnosis of schizophrenia, I'll just tell you a quick story because I have to go. There was a schizophrenic patient in my, pa in my practice who got schizophrenic after an EM rash. Absolutely, there was no doubt. He couldn't tolerate any medications. He was in a padded room in his home putting holes through the wall because no psych unit wanted to take this guy. We gave him Dapsone at 25 milligrams every other day because he was so sensitive. He had to stop it by the fourth dose. He did four doses of 25, very low. The Herx was so bad, and when he woke up from the Herx, he turned to his parents for the first time and said, hey, mom and dad, I'm hungry. When's dinner? The kid hadn't spoken for six years. After coming out of the worst Herx he had had with a schizophrenic history. Dapsone has great penetration into the central nervous system. The problem is the herxes from this drug that need to be controlled with all the stuff that you saw here today. But as I said, I would just go through that MSIDS map and use all the things that we talked about. And you'll probably find there are solutions. OK? Good. Blessings to you. of asking Dr. Horwitz to come down. Um, he, he actually turned down a few other uh, chances he had to speak in other places. He's not kidding when he said he turned down 18 uh, speaking engagements this year. Um, stand right there, Dr. Horwitz. Um, but he felt it was very important to come down to this area, uh, this region of the country, and speak here to you all today. Uh, this talk really just was just overwhelming. I mean, there was so much knowledge uh, passed here today. And that's why we really do need that video to go back over it and just, <laughs> it was just unbelievable. Um, Not just to listen to I, the song. I, I'm still almost speechless. And, and then the, the video of the song uh, just was the icing on the cake. So we feel, Nancy, would you come forward? 
We feel it's really important to honor the doctors that are on the front lines, the doctors that uh, have the courage to go out there and to treat patients like us and other patients out there that you see. And so we have what we call the Heart Award, and that's our thank you, because the heart to us represents, first of all, courage, um, commitment, and care. And we feel that you demonstrate all of those qualities, and you have for the past, what, 20, 30 years? How many years? 32 years. And you have accomplished so much, and we are so glad to see you are doing research because we need this uh, on the clinical uh, front. And because you doctors have all the information because you are treating the patients. Uh, this is innovative research. And we, um, again, can't thank you enough for caring enough uh, about patients to come and do something uh, like this for us. And so thank you very much for coming here today. And I want to give him a round of applause.